I am so excited to see all of you in person and to be here. It's just been, it's been tough, but it's really nice to be here in person in Boulder City and it, it's a, such a cute little community and um, I'm looking forward to this afternoon's field trip too. So welcome everyone to um, our March meeting. So at this time I'll call, the, call to order the uh, March meeting of the November Board of Wildlife Commissioners. And I'm going to ask Commissioner McNinch if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Missy, can you please call the roll of the commission? Absolutely. Commissioner McNitch? Here. Commissioner Perini? <laughs> Commissioner Rogers? Here. Commissioner Wise? Here. Commissioner Olmberg? Here. Commissioner Barnes? Commissioner Barnes is absent. Vice Chair Gavilia? Here. And Chairwoman East? Here. Thank you. Can we have the members of the county advisory boards please stand and introduce yourselves? Thank you. Glad to see you guys. Okay. Um, agenda item number two, approval of the agenda, Chairwoman East for possible action. The commission will, will review the agenda and may take action to approve the agenda. The commission may remove items from the agenda, continue items for consideration, or take items out of order. I have two quick notes. Um, we are going to remove agenda item 14E as the uh, Wildlife Heritage Committee was unable to meet. And we are going to take a uh, hard break at noon for lunch. Other than that, those are the changes that I have to the agenda. Does anyone have other changes? Okay, seeing them, this is an action item. We'll take it out for public comment. Any public comment on our agenda. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the committee for a motion, or the commission for a motion. Vice Chair Cavillia. All right, I'll make a um, move to approve the agenda as presented with the noted changes. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you. So we have a motion by Vice Chair Cavillia and a second by Commissioner Weiss to approve the agenda as presented with the noted changes. All in favor, please uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Barnes absent. It's really hard to get used to doing this in person again. <laughs> I'm used to saying raise your hand. <laughs> okay, we'll get there. Um, okay, agenda item number three, approval of the minutes. Chairwoman East for possible action. The commission minutes may be approved from the January 28th and 29th, 2022 meeting. Do we have any changes to the minutes? Does everyone have a chance to review them? Looking, yeah. No noted changes? Okay. Wow. All right. This is an action item. I'll take it out for public comment. Do we have any public comment on our January meeting minutes? And no public comment, so I'll be bring it back to the commission for approval. Do we have an approval on the minutes? Commissioner Rogers. Yes, I'd like to uh, uh, make a motion for approval of the minutes for the January 28th and 29th. Okay, I have, a, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. I have a motion by Commissioner Rogers and a second by Commissioner Perini to approve the minutes of January 28 and 29. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 8 to 0 with Barnes, Commissioner Barnes absent. Um, agenda item number 4. Member items, announcements, and correspondence. Chairwoman East, informational. 
Commissioners may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the Commission. Any item requiring Commission action may be scheduled on a future Commission agenda. The Commission will review and may discuss correspondence sent or received by the Commission since the last regular meeting and may provide copies for the exhibit file. Commissioners may provide hard copies of their correspondence for the written record. Correspondence sent or received by Secretary Wasley may also be discussed. And I don't have any particular items. Secretary Wasley, have you got anything? Okay. Commission members? Nothing. It's quiet up here today. Okay. We're moving on to agenda item number five, County Advisory Boards to Manage Wildlife Member Items Informational. CAB members may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the Commission. Any item requiring Commission action will be scheduled on a future Commission agenda. So, County Advisory Boards. Good morning, uh, Commission. Uh, Paul Dixon, Clark Cab. Um, I wanted first off at this moment to uh, thank Joe Bennett and uh, Tommy Casey, uh, who came and gave a presentation at my cab on guzzlers. I allotted them 20 minutes and then we had 40 minutes of questions and answers. They did a great job. Uh, it was a big hit with the cab and the public who, who were in attendance. So I wanted to personally thank them for that and give them a little shout out. The second thing is, is I did talk with Deputy Director Rob, but I, I said to the individual that sent me this correspondence to ask to have maybe a presentation for an understanding is they wondered why in the guided uh, hunt draw, um, they used to get results when it was um, Don Sefton's organization, SCI, in like eight to 10 hours after the draw, and now it's 72 hours before they get results. And so there's an underlying um, inference that something nefarious is going on, which I assured them there wasn't. They had to auto-validate and stuff, but it may be that we either put out a small presentation or do something to educate the public of why after the draw we have that window before we release results because we're validating. And I just don't think people understand that. That's all I have, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Dixon. Mr. Cram or Mr. Bunch? Nothing? Nothing, okay. We'll move on to agenda item number six, draft fiscal year 2023 predation management plan. Wildlife staff specialist Pat Jackson for possible action. The draft fiscal year 2023 predation management plan will be presented to the commission for review a report from the Predatory Animal and Road Committee Park meeting held on February 10th will be shared with the Commission. All comments from the Commission, Park, County Advisory Boards to wild, Manage Wildlife, and other interested publics will be compiled and shared with the Wildlife Damage Management Committee for their consideration at the March 2022 meeting. Five proposed mule deer enhancement predator management projects submitted by MDEP subcommittees and approved by the MDEP Oversight Committee will be considered for inclusion in the draft fiscal year 2023 predation management plan. Mr. Jackson. Uh, Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. Um, I don't know what else I'm supposed to do to make this work. Oh. You have a... I have a brief PowerPoint presentation and I may be okay. beaming it right at you. At me? Okay. I will move. Uh, Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. Uh, apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, I try not to touch the table too much that the screen doesn't work or shake rather. Uh, I too, uh, Chairwoman East, am excited about the meeting. So excited that I ended up on the agenda twice, uh, today and tomorrow. So I am going to just give, a, a, for the sake of brevity, a brief presentation on proposed changes in this year's plan, and then I will more thoroughly report out on uh, Predatory Animal and Rodent Committee and Wildlife Damage Management Committee recommendations uh, to, on tomorrow's agenda item. So with that, uh, we can get a little lost in where we are in, in various fiscal years. So at the November meeting, I reported out on fiscal year 2021. We are currently in fiscal year 2022. A fiscal year goes from July 1 to June 30 of the following year. And the plan being presented 
uh, in, in brevity today is for fiscal year 2023. All the previous plans and reports uh, should be available on the website, and if you can't find them, please send an email, and I will uh, uh, provide what you request. A little about the $3 predator fee. Uh, it now generates about $858,000. Of that, $14,000 goes to the Department of Agriculture for administrative support. Uh, the remainder is available for various predator plans, as we'll hear uh, in part today. It's also used on staff salary, and it's a unique funding source in that it doesn't revert back to a general fund. Any reserves do remain available and usable for future years. And then the three acceptable expenditures uh, set forth in NRS are the management of predatory wildlife, the research on lethal control techniques of predatory wildlife, and the protection of sensitive species. And we are mandated to spend 80% of the revenues for which we have uh, accurate uh, fiscal records and that lethal component, uh, the autonomy is left at the department to determine uh, how much they, of monitoring they want to have with lethal removal and that does count towards that 80%. Uh, and then the budget summary, I have to get a little creative here. Uh, you can see we generated exactly $858,601. To meet the 80% mandate, we would need to spend $686,881. And in this year's proposed budget, we have uh, the options to spend upwards of $759,000. Uh, now skipping ahead to projects that we are proposing a change in some capacity. Project 40 is a multifaceted uh, project that's been going on for a few years now in Eureka County. Uh, it started out to complement some work that Eureka County had done with predator removal and then also some nearby habitat uh, manipulations as well as the horse roundup. It has an annual budget of $100,000 and it's predominantly removing coyotes uh, and to a lesser degree mountain lions in, uh, in Hunt Unit 144. The proposed changes, we have a new area game biologist on site, uh, Sam Fino and she has a robust predator-prey background, and so she has proposed uh, to increase the monitoring uh, with the use of trail cameras before and during coyote removal to understand changes in coyote densities, and then the, the potential deployment of vaginal implant transmitters on does, which would involve uh, capturing adult female deer and then, uh, and then their fawns after they're born. Um, project 41, uh, Common Raven Management and Experimentation. This is predominantly a collaboration with the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, we've learned a lot of different things about ravens, uh, their space use, their populations in the Great Basin, and also in other uh, biomes of the uh, western part of uh, North America. So there, uh, any day now I'm told, but I've been told that for a few months, there, it will be published a special issue in Human Wildlife Interactions that uh, debuts a lot of these efforts. Uh, they've also developed a tool that they refer to the, uh, uh, is the smart tool that's gonna help us and Al and USDA Wildlife Services uh, 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 specify where we conduct uh, uh, common raven removal. Uh, the proposed change to this is due to a limit of uh, Pittman-Robertson funds, we, the game division, may not have enough money to match a $3 fee with uh, PR to fund this project, so we may fund it all or in part with $3 fee for this upcoming fiscal year, and we do have that amount in the reserve. Uh, project 46 is the investigating potential limiting factors of mule deer in northwest Nevada. This is a uh, $160,000 project. It does, we are intending to match 75% uh, of those expenditures with PR funds, and I also have in a heritage proposal. Uh, and it's occurring in northwest Nevada. And uh, the, the main purpose is to deploy a series of trail cameras to come up with density estimates, lions, horses, uh, deer, and potentially pronghorn. And we're also deploying some uh, weather stations to look at microclimate and hope to have a greater understanding of uh, predator-prey dynamics in uh, a, a part of Nevada that's pretty imperished with, uh, with drought. Uh, and this is a collaboration with Oxford and the University of Montana. There's a postdoc that lives in Reno that does the lion's share of the uh, trail camera work as well as the analyses. Um, and then the proposed addition 
is in an internal meeting a few months ago with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Indau, there was a discussion on deploying line transmitters on uh, lines within the Sheldon uh, National Wildlife Refuge. There was uh, quite a bit of appetite for that on both sides, both with the state and with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we are in the initial stages of performing a Wildlife Service EA, which I've been told the refuge has a lot more decision-making power than a similar EA process with the BLM, and so that the uh, process could be done as little as three to five months. And we're optimistic that that will be done, and we can deploy transmitters on lines uh, this year. Uh, if that happens, then that will benefit any number of projects. It would benefit this project uh, it, to a greater inform the camera models on habitat and home range size. It would be, uh, benefit uh, another project, Project 42. Our lion population model would also uh, educate the department on what lions are doing on the Sheldon. If we deployed a certain number of transmitters on the Sheldon, we would attempt to do a similar thing off just to see that compare and contrast of uh, uh, just going through different life, uh, it'd be different for a lion on or off the refuge, and we like to see those differences and similarities in their space use and, and diet. And, uh, and then this is also the first stage uh, in working with the Fish and Wildlife Service to either justify a lion hunt on the Sheldon or to allow for uh, lethal management of lions if and when it's determined necessary for the protection of uh, bighorn sheep. And this may or may not be funded with, uh, with PR funds, but if it's not, then we can fund it exclusively with $3 fee. And uh, I keep pushing the wrong button. And um, that's, that's it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jackson. Does anyone have questions for Mr. Jackson? Commissioner Keel. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Jackson. So with the proposed additions, is that displacing other work that we have previously reviewed or, go ahead. Uh, so Pat Jackson, staff specialist. Uh, the, the question is, is would we be taking something off the table if we do this work? And uh, I, uh, no, I don't believe so. And are you requesting more money to compensate for that or do you just feel that you can manage that within the scope of uh, this plan? Uh, regarding Project 40, I believe that we'll either be able to shoulder that expense or uh, there might be some other funding mechanisms depending on the, the breadth and width of the work. And then regarding Project uh, uh, 46 and the deployment of, uh, uh, of, of trail cameras, I'm sorry, of, of collars on, uh, on lions. Uh, if, and I'll go into greater detail on this tomorrow, but a statewide lion project we have, Project 37, uh, is a statewide lion management project. And so if we weren't able to fund Project 46 and match it with Pittman-Robertson funds, uh, we would be able to use uh, Project 37 funds to uh, purchase those transmitters and then in the following year, I would either start a new project or propose a new project or uh, increase the budget uh, associated with uh, Project 46. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Jackson? No? Okay. We will see you again tomorrow for sure. Mm. Right there. Okay. Uh, moving on to agenda item number seven. Approval for it. Yes. We didn't take any action. Oh, I guess, yeah, sure. No, we did not. I, I was only doing it as informational, but we can take it out for public comment. Do we have any public comment on agenda item number six, the management plan? Okay. Thank you. Agenda item number seven, approval for elk damage management plan ma payment. Sorry, let me start over. <laughs> number seven, approval for elk damage payment exceeding $10,000. Elk staff specialist Cody McKee for possible action. An assessment of elk damage on Granite Peak White Ranch in White Pine County totaling $19,170 
was completed by department personnel and submitted for reimbursement by Bruce Hubbard, agent for the property. Per NAC 504.421, section 1F, a loss on one site must be limited to $10,000 unless the commission determines that a claimant may be paid more and there is sufficient money to pay him or her. The commission will need to approve the elk damage claim so the department can pay the claim. Hi, right. Mr. McKee. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Cody McKee, Wildlife Staff Specialist, for the record. Um, I'm getting used to the technology myself. Do I need uh, really, the department is here um, to, to, to ask for your approval on this damage claim. We provided the information compiled and support material. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about um, forms that were submitted as well as elk damage occurring on the property. Um, this, this was a significant event occurring on the Granite Peak Ranch um, starting in June in excess of 100 elk. Spent much of their day frequenting the alfalfa pivots. There's 11 uh, irrigated uh, center pivots on the Nevada side of the border. Um, and that use lasted until early December. And so based on our calculations of elk use, what we know from literature on consumption rates, and then really the amazingly high prices of alfalfa right now, um, it led to this assessment, um, which the department feels is very appropriate in this case. Okay. Does anyone have questions for Mr. McKee? Commissioner Rogers, and then Commissioner Cavalia. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, ju I just had to, two questions. One is the funding for this, and I may have missed it, but just curious where um, the, the funding for this um, uh, comes from, from the department. Uh, Commissioner Rogers, Cody McKee, for the record. So this funding comes from the $5 elk damage fee that's paid on every elk application. Um, and that money is specifically earmarked to go towards addressing elk damage, either through the direct reimbursement for lost property or damage, through you know f fences being knocked down or consumption of fields, as well as constructing fences to exclude elk from property. Um, as you'll see in the uh, attached memo, the current account balance for elk damage is nearly $2 million. Um, we expect given application trends that we will probably be depositing another $400,000 into the account after this upcoming application season. And, and the second question is, I, I know it hasn't occurred since I have been on the commission, but have we uh, paid to this particular ranch elk damage in the past or is this the first time? Commissioner Roberts, Rogers, uh, Cody McKee again for the record, this is the first time that we have paid this ranch for elk damage. Um, in fact, Bruce Hubbard is, a, is newly entered in, um, in our program. And, and really what, what we saw this last year based on the, the ongoing and excessive drought conditions in Nevada was um, these uh, desert oasis pulled not just elk, but, but many of our wildlife species. And so we saw a lot of private landowners supporting Nevada wildlife populations. Um, we do have plans in place to try and address the issue on this particular property. Um, as you guys recall, we approved a new depredation hunt in 114 um, or 115 this, this last, uh, at the last commission meeting. Um, we're hopeful that added pressure on elk will help to alleviate some of those issues. We're also in ongoing conversations with Bruce Hubbard and the Granite Peak Ranch on other potential actions that we could take if our depredation hunt isn't effective. Okay. Uh, have I checked Bill yet? Yeah. Okay. He answered the question. Any other questions? Commissioner Holmberg. Just a comment. I'm sure he's fences. <laughs> fences. Yeah. Uh, can you make sure your mic is on? Oh, I just, And that you're speaking into it? I'm sorry. I just uh, stress the importance of the, uh, you know, the potential of the fences for sure. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Okay, 
So this is an action item. We'll take it out for public comment. Do we have any public comment on agenda item number seven? Uh, Paul Dixon, Chair of the Cart Cap, for the record. Uh, Paul Dixon, Chair of the Clark Cab, for, for the record. Um, at our cab, we had a lot of discussion, and one of the questions was asking, and, and Commissioner Omberg asked it, was, was fences. But my understanding of fencing is it's extremely expensive. In other words, upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars. So how many years could we pay elk damage before we would actually pay for a fence? Was, was a question that was asked me, and I didn't know the answer, and so I thought I would just would, would raise it here as to, because fences are so expensive, and the, the, the uh, dimensions of what you actually have to fence. I mean, if you have six pivots, that's a lot of fence, guys. I'm just leaving it here. You're talking millions of dollars. It may eat up the whole fund. Um, and the other question was, is because, as pointed out by, by Cody, that we are actually habituating animals during a drought to, to these desert oases, um, should we, I just wondered when he said we we're thinking of other mitigation methods besides fencing, I just wondered if he could expound on those so that I could repeat those back to my cat at my next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Any other public comment? Okay, seeing none, Mr. McKee, would you like to respond to Mr. Dixon? Yeah, Cody McKee, Wildlife Staff Specialist for the department. Um, I'll try and answer, uh, Mr. Dixon's first comment regarding fencing. And it is extremely expensive to, to build a fence around a single pivot, let alone 11. Um, one of the other challenges with this particular property is that it is built right on the border with Utah. And mm -hmm. in fact, there's one of the pivots that's actually part of it's in Nevada and part of it's in Utah. And so we would have to collaboratively work with Utah in order to build the fence either into their state or we could build it right down the, the state line um, through their pivot, which I would expect they probably wouldn't be very happy about that. Um, and then, you know, as a department, we try to make sure that we're using the sportsman's dollars um, where it's needed and not necessarily wanted. This is a, a, a fairly new issue and so we want to make sure that we exhaust our other measures before we go towards that um, fairly expensive endeavor of building a fence. I, I would expect this is going to be several hundred thousand dollars, if not more, if we went to that, went that direction. Um, a, another comment related to fencing, um, and, it, and it kind of ties back to the nuances of both the elk damage program as well as our deer and antelope mm -hmm. compensation program. Um, a lot of these properties are both receiving, at times can receive elk damage compensation for, for damage caused by elk, but they're also enrolled in the deer and antelope compensation program where they're, being, where they're receiving tags for deer and antelope in the fields. And when we put a fence on that field, it effectively excludes everything from the property. So we don't always see um, a fence is being desired by, by the landowner. Now there's some nuances in the program when we get to that point, but we like to make sure that everybody's ready for the fence when we offer that. Um, the, third, the third point, Mr. Dixon uh, asked what the corrective measures were that we had discussed, and, and the fence is absolutely one of those. Again, we look, looking at that as a last resort. Um, we're offering this new uh, depredation hunt, antlerless depredation hunt, that's going to be uh, within two miles of the Granite Peak Ranch properties. Hunters that have that tag um, with permission would potentially be able to hunt on the Granite Peak Ranch property, which we know from literature, um, hunting pressure is probably the most effective way at moving elk from anywhere and putting them into places they should be. Um, that's going to take some coordination with, with the manager themselves to get to that point. Um, and then we also offer our private lands antlerless elk hunt. Um, and if this continues to be an ongoing issue, um, we have been very, very um, accommodating with Mr. Hubbard and the Granite Peak Ranch as we've worked through these issues. Um, but if this problem continues to persist, we'll be um, 
more direct in the actions that need to be taken and and how we can can move elk off of his off of his property Great. did that spur any other comments or questions commissioner Allenberg. Uh, no i i, I want to just comment on on their cooperation the level of cooperation this is new new it just didn't happen yesterday you know it's been going on for a while it, it's they've had a lot of tolerance to it um, but there just becomes a point where it's not no longer tolerable. But no, I, I wanted to make sure that uh, you know clearly the damage is done, and they've been super good about being patient with this and cooperative. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, Commissioner Albert. Anybody else? No. Okay. You need a motion from us. Yes, <laughs> a, a motion to approve a the to the damage approve. payment. Do I have a motion to approve the uh, damages of $19,170? Okay, Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, I'd like to make a motion for, a, for approval for the elk damage payment uh, on the Granite Peak Ranch in White Pine County, totaling $19,170. Thank you, do I have a second? Second. Okay, I have a second by Commissioner McNinch and Commissioner Allenberg. <laughs> all right, uh, so we have a motion by Commissioner Rogers and a second by Commissioner McNinch. Do all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Barnes absent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're moving on to agenda item number eight, appeal. So is our party here? Jack Rob, for the record. Hi. Uh, I just spoke to the counsel for the appellant. Uh, our staff had indicated that we had quite a few items to go through this morning before we started his appeal and indicated it would be 11, 11.30 before we started. I just spoke to their counsel. He'll be here a little after 11 to get going. Okay. Okay. So do we want to move agenda item number nine up? We have other people showing up for agenda item number nine. Uh, some people we probably don't want to avoid. And then uh, the field trip is pretty much time specific uh, at three o'clock because we do have other invited guests showing up at the three o'clock time frame. Okay, so, so we'll just take a break until 11? Is that your suggestion? Yeah, we should take a break until they show up. I'd say it'll be a little after 11, maybe start 11.15. And I, I did indicate to their council that we would take a hard stop at noon. So okay. he is aware of that. Okay. All right. So we'll take a break until 1115. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay, is everyone ready to go? All right, we'll bring it back uh, 
to the commission. Uh, we're now on agenda item number eight, which is an appeal for Mr. James Collard, a subguide denial for possible action. Mr. Collard is appealing the suspension of his guide license for a term of three years. And um, as we did last commission meeting, we're going to be following NAC 501.165, which is a hearing de novo, evidence and allegations at certain hearings. Um, I'm going to read through part of this, and then I'll ask um, our DAG if he has anything to add. Um, number one, except as otherwise provided in subsection two, a hearing regarding a denial, revocation, or suspension of a license or permit ordered pursuant to the provisions of chapter, chapters 501 to 506, inclusive of NRS and any regulations adopted pursuant to those chapters, will be conducted by the commission as a hearing de novo. Number two, the commission will use the following procedure in order to set forth in paragraphs A through E, inclusive for a hearing regarding a denial of each of an appellant's application for a license or permit ordered pursuant to the provisions of chapters 501 to 506, inclusive of NRS and any regulation adopted pursuant to those chapters. And I will walk through the um, procedure as we, as we approach it. So. Um, Mr. Weiss, do you have anything to add? Okay, thank you. Does anyone have questions about the procedure? Commissioner Keel? No, no questions about the procedure, but I did want to disclose to this body that um, I'm a friend and acquaintance of Special Investigator Giles. I've known each other for you know, our entire lives, but at this point, I'm not recusing myself from the vote. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have disclaimers or questions about the procedure? Okay, thank you. So, um, procedure 2A is the appellant will present its evidence and then be cross-examined by the department and, and questioned by the commission. So, are you ready? Can you make sure that you speak into the microphone? Got it. There you go. Yes, thank you. He actually needs to turn the microphone. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, if it's green, it's, it's on. Turn it, yeah, you just have, there you go. Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, Commissioner Keel, is there a reason that you're uh, unwilling to recuse yourself if you have a close relationship with uh, uh, the investigating officer in this matter? The last communication I think I've had with uh, Special Investigator Giles was probably Q2 or Q3 of last year, 2022. And you know, no discussions, obviously, on this case, or for that matter, I don't think any other case over the course of you know our friendship. So, okay. And in the event that it's a close call, um, fair to say you might give a little more uh, weight to uh, Warden Giles than uh, based on that relationship. No, I don't believe that is a fair statement. I completely believe that I can be you know, fair and impartial in okay. any judgment we reach today. Okay, fair enough. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, Director Rob. I don't see Director Rob. I wanted to shake your hand. Um, yes. But that comes out, but whatever, I don't know much about it or him or anything dealing with that. Sure, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner Perini. Thank you. I mean, at the end of the day, all my client wants is, is fair treatment, equal treatment under the law. And so I appreciate the disclosure, Commissioner Keel. I appreciate uh, your, your uh, assurance that it won't influence your decision in any way. And uh, Commissioner Perini, I appreciate your uh, acknowledgement as well, so thank you. Uh, so again, Commissioners, Director Rob, Captain Creamer, uh, Secretary Wasley, um, Vice Chair Caviglia, Caviglia, did I get that right this time? <laughs> uh, Madam Chair East and uh, others present. Uh, my name is Ben Cloward and I represent Mr. Collard who is here today. He's present uh, in the gym, seated behind me. And uh, first off, I want to acknowledge Director Rob and his office. Uh, they worked very hard in, in uh, getting us certain documents. We submitted a FOIA request uh, to look at suspensions over the prior 10 years uh, so, that, so that we could provide the Commission with uh, facts and evidence so that the Commission could, could really uh, make a decision that's based on 
um, equal and fair uh, treatment. And the way to do that is to look at other cases and other facts and other circumstances and other suspensions that took place so that there is equal and fair um, uh, unbiased treatment in this situation. Uh, additionally, I, I would like to express thanks to Captain Kramer for answering some questions, procedural questions along the way, and thank you for that. Um, one thing, just for the record, um, I did have a, a comment or a conversation with um, Dag Burkett off, off the record before we started today, and I do believe there's a constitutional uh, Sixth Amendment um, constitutional consideration that was violated uh, by Mr. Collard in the prosecution of this case, some prosecutorial misconduct. Um, there was some evidence that was not turned over during the prosecution of, of his underlying event. That information was provided just recently, about nine days ago. So I am reserving the right to uh, challenge that uh, plea arrangement because he didn't have that information at the time that he made that plea agreement. Um, however, I didn't want to waste everybody's time. I, the, the state's time is very important. Each of your time is very important to me and to my client. And so um, I elected to move forward, uh, but we have an agreement with uh, uh, Dag Burkett that this is not a way for me moving forward with this hearing at this time. I want to put that on the record. Um, now, uh, can, using can I, the- Can I just clarify? I want to just stipulate to that fact and make it clear to the commission that w what Mr. Cloward is representing is accurate. That has to do with the criminal matter, not this matter here, just to be clear with all. Okay. Okay? Thank okay, you. thank you. Correct. Uh, but obviously this, this, uh, this hearing, this suspension hearing, appeal hearing is based on the underlying conviction. So without the underlying conviction, nobody would be here today. Um, but before we, we go through some of the documents, um, uh, Director Rob was kind enough to provide me the link last time of, I believe his name is Troy Rob, his suspension. And that's what the transcript that I, that I handed to each of you is. Uh, the transcript, unfortunately, wasn't available until Thursday, so I apologize for the delay. But that is a transcript of the proceedings last, uh, last suspension hearing. And I think it's particularly relevant because the charge was identical. It was camera after season uh, and so forth. Um, but using the format that Captain Creamer used last time, rather than call a bunch of witnesses and uh, cross-examine folks and, and have this be a very long process. I'm going to use the same format that Captain Creamer utilized in the last session, which is to simply walk through some of the relevant documents and to explain why those documents are important and, and should be considered uh, in this matter involving my client. So as a procedural matter, the, the documents we have, you should have two stacks of documents. One that's produced by Mr. Collard, and that's the, the binder and they should be numbered one through approximately 170 something, some odd uh, pages. And then there's also a manila folder with some, some colored tabs that was provided by the state. Rather than reprint the state's exhibits, which we have, we're going to be using those, but rather than reprint them and making the, the record even more voluminous and wasting resources, I just incorporate those by reference, but we'll be kind of going back and forth between, between the two. Um, and if, if I ever refer to a document and it, for some reason the page isn't coming up for each of you commissioners, please let me know. I'm happy to get another copy. I'm happy to direct you so that you have the important information that you need uh, in, in making a termination in this matter. So um, the reason that we're here today is we're here today because of an honest mistake, all right? There's a difference between an honest mistake and a purposeful, intentional uh, disregarding of, the, of the, the laws. And there's a, a big difference with somebody who has made a good faith mistake versus somebody who intentionally tries to hide and tries to evade the law. So one of the exhibits, the first thing I'd like the um, the commission to look at is the, the map. So if the if commissioner would actually look at the photographs that were produced by uh, Captain Creamer just now, the commission can see the different boundary lines at issue. And so this is, 
this is one of the unbundled documents. It's the photographs, and these were produced uh, by Captain Kramer this morning to my office. Um, I was, I've utilized and have incorporated some of the documents, similar documents in the, in the documents that I, I produced. Um, but as the Commission can see, these boundary lines are different. There are differing boundary lines depending on the online service that's used, whether it be Onyx, whether it be Garmin, or whether it actually uh, goes to uh, the, the Lincoln County assessor. So there are actually three different boundary lines based on which information you use. Um, one of the photographs that um, I attach to the documents that I've just produced is a photograph from Mr. Collard um, taking a picture of his Garmin indicating that the spring head, the big spring head, is actually on Bruce Jensen's property. Bruce Jensen was the property owner that was giving permission to Mr. Collard to have this, this camera on the, uh, the property. And that photograph is, and again, I wish that these were numbered. I apologize that they're not. But I want to make sure that the commission has the photograph. OK. It's the photograph of just the, the Garmin with uh, an individual holding the hand, holding it out in their hand. And as the commission can see, based on this online boundary issue, um, the Big Springs spring is actually on the Jensen property. And when the photographs that were produced by the state are compared, the commission can see that there are different boundary lines. And one of the orienting factors that is helpful in reviewing this matter is the roadway. So you can see the roadway, it comes to a V. And on one of the photographs, the V indicates that the roadway goes right up to BLM property. However, on another photograph, and these are contained in, in plaintiff's exhibit, on another photograph, this one for instance, the roadway is well on pub or private land. So in one situation, the road goes right up to private land, or excuse me, to public land. And then in the other overhead, the road is well, well, well on private land, not even close to the, the public. Um, Commissioner Olmberg, may I approach and I can show, I can show, you, show you this. So I think it is important. And I'm just going to show uh, a comparison of these so that the commission understands the, the different photographs that I'm talking about. However, when the, when the Commission looks at even the, the other Onyx, uh, the, the Garmin, the property is even different from there. And so one of the things um, that uh, Prosecuting Attorney Frainer did, one of the witnesses that he actually was going to call was the Lincoln County Assessor to come down and give testimony about the boundary line because this was an issue. He had to call the witness to come down and testify and say, hey, look, here's the, here's the correct and true boundary line. And uh, so there was a big dispute about that. And as a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Collard was initially charged with two camera violations. But after, after Mr. Frainer, prosecuting attorney Frainer, did the research, he actually found, oh, yeah, you know what? One of them actually is on private. And so one of those charges was dismissed. So again, this is a situation, this is an honest mistake. This is not him going out there and intentionally trying to evade 
uh, putting a hidden camera somewhere. These cameras, you can drive right up the road. You can look directly from the road. This isn't a situation where he had to hike in three or four miles and he's placing a camera hoping that nobody finds, finds it. So that's the first, the first issue that I'd like to talk about. The next issue that I would like to talk about is uh, the report of, um, uh, I believe it's, uh, it was Warden Anderson's report. Warden Anderson set forth in his report, and I believe that it is Exhibit, uh, exhibit 6 of the state's exhibits. Pardon me. I believe it's actually Exhibit uh, 9, or I'm sorry. Exhibit 7. I'm all over the place here. It's Exhibit 7, page 2 of Exhibit 7. Page 2 of Exhibit 7 contains a, a text exchange that Mr. Collard had with Warden, uh, with Warden, let's see, it looks like potentially both or uh, Warden Giles or potentially Warden um, Anderson. But it's on the, the interview took place on December 1st, 2020. But in that interview, the warden set forth, and this is a quote from the report, it says, quote, Collard had sent me a text message on July 30, 2020. The conversation read as follows. Collard, hey man, it's legal to leave a trail camera on private property, correct? Warden Anderson, they can be on private land only if you have permission from that landowner. Collard, copy that. Should you have written permission with you? I'm only asking because a few of the farmers are wanting me to leave cams so they can see usage. Warden Anderson, written permission helps you in case they deny it but not required. Collard, all right, thanks, man. So this is a situation that before the uh, violative period, the violative period would be August 1st. That's when it's violated. That's when it's illegal to have them from August 1st till December 31st. So before that time period, Mr. Collard is confirming, confirming with the fish and game, with the warden, hey, I want to make sure that I understand this correctly. I want to make sure that, that my knowledge of this situation is correct. Okay, and I'm going to compare and contrast that attitude and that, that uh, the way that he handled himself with the way that um, Mr. Robb in the last suspension handled himself. So um, it's important to note again, he is seeking clarification. He thinks that he's on private property. There's a huge boundary line border, border dispute on the, the property itself such that the prosecuting attorney has to call the, the uh, the assessor to come down and give testimony in the prosecution, and they actually end up dropping one of the one of the charges because it was was in fact on private. Now, moving along, one other thing that is is worth noting, just briefly, is that the the property in one of the photographs that I I provided, it shows, and it's the it's actually the photograph of the deer. Um, the photograph of the deer in the camera um, on July 24th. If, if everyone would be uh, so kind as to look in the far right-hand corner, um, the far right-hand corner, there's actually a building. This photograph doesn't hardly show it, but it's actually a red building out on the property. So again, this isn't something that is off in the mountains where nobody else can find. You drive down the road, there's a building, um, and there's, the important thing is, is there's mastication around the building. So the, the area has been cleared, which further gave Mr. Collard the belief that the cleared area was in fact private property. That's very close to this building, that's actually on the property, that's within you know, two or 300 yards of, uh, of this spring. That's another um, another thing that Mr. Collardy made a mistake. He thought, hey, look, this area is cleared. This is the property. I've been told by Bruce Jensen that this is the property. He made a big mistake. Um, 
Now, it's important to note that when Mr. Collard learned of these mistakes, when Sergeant Giles and, or excuse me, Warden Giles and Warden Anderson requested to speak with him, he went down to the field office. He didn't have to do that. He didn't call a lawyer. He didn't, he didn't say, you know what, I'm not willing to talk to you. He went down and talked to them. And they told him about this. And he said, you know what, I thought that was private. Uh, I made a mistake. And told him right off the bat. Matter of fact, he signed a confession right there. He signed a statement and said, I did it. It was my cameras. I thought that it was on private. So this isn't a situation where he's, he's trying to say, I didn't do it, um, or, or he's trying to point the finger at somebody else or anything along those lines. Now, I want to talk a little bit, I want to focus next on the, uh, the last hearing with, uh, with Mr. Robb, Troy Robb. And the important thing with Troy Robb uh, that I think is important for the Commission to consider, there are only three violations of this camera law ever. My FOIA request, which I'll get to in a moment, requested any and all suspensions for the last decade for any reason. So any reason at all that anyone has had a suspension, I'd like to know the reasons, the facts, understand why, give me the information so that, so that I can provide that to the commission to make an educated decision today. And a lot of those are not, it's not like comparing apples to apples. It's, you know, they're still fruits. It's maybe an orange to an apple, but it's not an apple to an apple. You know, some of them, it's a, you're, you know, you're traveling in a wilderness area. Um, others, you know, one of them was actually unlawful contact with a minor. It was a criminal charge. Um, and there are some other examples. But the two examples with respect to camera violations, I think those are the most apple to apple for comparison reasons. Commissioner Rogers, he's not here. Oh, Commissioner Rogers. <laughs> you asked a great question at the last hearing of Troy Robb, and this is the question that you asked. You said, quote, were you unaware when you place, placed a camera on any trail camera laws in Nevada? So you were concerned, you were wondering, well, you know, were you just unaware of any sort of laws here? And his response is telling, and it says, and I quote, no, I knew what the law was. I didn't know what the ramifications of a guide license were for a wildlife crime. I didn't know that they could suspend your license for up to five years. So here you have a situation where the individual is making a risk assessment. He is saying, I know that it's illegal, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm upset and, and sad after the fact when I get caught and find out that it's a three-year suspension. That's the analysis that he did. He was upset because the penalty was so severe. Uh, Commissioner uh, McNinch, you wisely caught on to this too. And during, your he during the, uh, the hearing, you asked a follow-up on the exact issue. You said, and I quote, if you did understand the ramifications or potential problems or the penalties with relation to your guide license, would that have impacted your use of the trail cameras? And Mr. Robb said, yes, sir. So again, that's a bad situation. That is a bad thing when you have an individual that is making their decision based on the severity of the punishment. Okay? Saying, well, I'm not going to go out and rob a bank um, unless it's, a, it's jail time of 15 years. But if it's only one year, I'm going to go out and rob the bank. And that's exactly what Mr. Robb was doing. He knew that it was wrong, yet he chose to do it because he didn't understand the penalty or the severity. So it's kind of like someone that, you know, in his situation, if the court, or I mean, if the commission uh, reviews the entire transcript, you'll see one thing that is, is very common throughout is that he continues to say, well, I just didn't know what the penalty was. I didn't know what the penalty was. And that's like if somebody robs a bank and then they're brought to justice and they say, well, judge, you know, yeah, I knew it was wrong to rob the bank, but geez, Louise, I didn't know that I was going to get 15 years in prison. You know, I didn't know that. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. And for both um, Commissioner Barnes and Madam Chair East, um, there was some clarification regarding the use of the cameras during the prohibited time. Um, Commissioner Barnes asked a question, and it's Commissioner Barnes that's not here, uh, but Chairwoman East, Madam Chair East, 
asked him in particular, quote, so you leave the cameras out that aren't transmitting and then you go back to them? And Mr. Rob went on to say, and this is, this is, this is telling, he goes on to say, yeah, I guess, and so it was probably more of a lapse in judgment on my case for leaving them in there. So the commissioner, as I understand, is saying, hey, you've got these cameras, but you're not out there checking them. What, reconcile this for me. And he says, well, yeah, it was a lapse in judgment for leaving them in there to kind of deflect. And he goes on further and he says, and he tries to make it sound like that because he runs a lot of cameras, he goes to a lot of places, and there's cameras that get left out every year all over the state of Nevada from people that are just lazy or don't want to pick them up. That's lines 1 through 11 of the transcript at page 12. So here you have an individual that is essentially saying, well, yeah, it was just a lapse in judgment. I left it out there, kind of trying to deflect, saying, well, geez, a lot of people leave cameras out, so blaming other people, a defense attribution of, of, hey, you know, lots of people do this kind of a thing. That was his position. And Madam Chair East is very sharp listening because you followed up you're paying very close attention. You followed it up. You, you didn't let him get off on that. And you said, and I quote, well, we still don't know when you placed them. You're saying May or June, but we see in the statement October. So it's still not making sense to, to you and I think to others. Uh, uh, others followed up. So um, Madam Chair East also asked, you know, you went back in September, because he responded and he said, well, I placed them in May and I came back in September. So I think, Madam Chair, you pointed out that um, there was some information about October. And I think you were trying to reconcile, well, if, you, if you're saying you put them out in June, um, but there's this October date, what, what's going on here? And his response was, well, I came back in September to check the cameras. Now that he's got busted, now that he's, there's some turning the screws on, on him. And um, so your follow-up question, Madam Chair, was, well, don't you think you should have removed them when you went back? But even then, even then he still was not truthful with the commission because later on what we learned when Captain Creamer presented facts against Mr. Robb, Captain Creamer showed the photograph of Mr. Robb on October 14, 2020, checking and maintaining the cameras on that date. And that is page 15 of the transcript where he offered that testimony. So here we have Mr. Robb admitting to checking the cameras in September. We have evidence that he checked them in October as well. And if he had never been caught, think about this, when he uh, retrieved the cameras in January of the next year or in December of that year, that would have been a third time that he illegally checked the cameras because he would have been able to view data between um, October 14th and December 31. So that would have been three times that he's out there uh, checking these cameras. So, and he admitted to Warden Anderson on page 18 of the transcript that he had checked the cameras several times since he placed them. So he tells Warden Anderson one thing, he comes before the commission and says another thing, and then, you know, it's through the evidence of Captain Creamer that it's testified that no, it's actually, um, you know, he's checking several times. So, and multiple times through the hearing, there was this, uh, this apology, kind of like, hey, I feel really bad about this, I'm, I'm not, I don't do this, it's not my character, and so forth, and I'm not talking, I don't know the man, okay? I don't know the man, but I do think that it's important for the commission to compare the facts of each case. But it appears from reading the transcript that the, that the remorse was from getting caught, not breaking the law. And there were several times where he said, well, geez, Louise, if I'd only known that it was going to result in the uh, suspension, I wouldn't have done. But the facts and the evidence were that he knew very well what he was doing and that it was illegal. In fact, on page 18, lines 12 through 15, um, this is where Mr. Robb told Warden Anderson, and this is a quote from the transcript, quote, he thought the cameras were in such a hard to find spot that he thought no one else knew about them. Then he got complacent about the law and thought no one would locate the spring or the camera. So he knows it's wrong, but he thinks that they're hidden so far up in there that he's never going to get caught. That's a conscious, willful, intentional act. 
so again, I would ask the commission when uh, Mr. Collar's suspension of three years, uh, it, whether it's fair and justified. Uh, the commission, I'm asking the commission to compare Mr. Robb's conduct with that of Mr. Collard. And it's important to point out during the hearing, uh, Captain Creamer was asked, you know, why did the commission, or excuse me, why did Endow impose three years? What was the justification for that? What was the rationale? And he said that he charged Mr. Robb with three years and said that he chose, chose three years because Mr. Robb intentionally failed to obey the law he willfully violated the law, and that he felt like this was a uh, middle-of-the-road suspension for an intentional wildlife violation. Now, Captain uh, Kramer explained that he did not charge a longer term because he was honest, forthcoming, and cooperative. Captain Kramer also compared past suspensions of guides for things like failing to provide current first aid, paperwork violations, and those cases, he said that guide license were generally reinstated once the proper documents were provided. He said that guides were suspended or denied for a year. And all of this is on page 22 of the transcript. I would really hope that the, that the commission believes in equal justice and equal treatment for all people and that injustice occurs when someone is singled out and treated indifferently. Our society depends on equal treatment under the law. Let's compare the goalposts that were established by Captain Kramer when he assessed three-year suspension for Mr. Robb with the issues of Mr. Collard. Number one, Mr. Collard did not intentionally violate the law. He did not carefully weigh the risk versus the penalty and say to himself, well, I'll take the risk. Instead, he made several honest mistakes. Um, the commission is aware that Mr. Collard thought that both of his cameras were on private property which would have been 100% lawful and legal. Unfortunately, with the boundary line issues that I've described, one of those cameras was not, in fact, lawful or legal. But that was not an intentional choice that he made trying to hide the camera. Further, it's worth noting that Mr. Collar did exactly the opposite of Mr. Robb. Mr. Collar contacted Warden Anderson before he left the cameras to clarify whether, in fact, it actually was legal. Warden Anderson told him that it was lawful. And this should be compared with Mr. Robb's testimony, which was that he placed cameras in a hard-to-find spot, believing that no one would find them, and he knew that it was wrong. Next, I would like to turn to the suspension of Garrett Johnson. Garrett Johnson, his offense was also for a camera left out after season. His offense also had an element of bait involved. Commissioner Allberg, you asked questions in the last uh, hearing that seemed to suggest that equal justice and equal treatment are important to you. Specifically, you asked for some details and comparison about the Rob, or, excuse me, about the Johnson suspension and how that compared with the facts of Mr. Rob's case. Your question is on page 28 of the transcript, and you were asking about you know, well, his had an element of baiting, what are the differences, and so forth. Captain Kramer responded, number one, that the recommendation was made under a different wildlife captain, and number two, it was based on a different set of facts and circumstances altogether. Well, first and foremost, the Commission's decision should not be based on personal opinions or views of an individual. For there to be justice and fairness in any system, there must be equal application of rules to specific facts on a case-by-case -case basis. The personal views of one person versus another person should not dictate punishment. It should not dictate what happens to anyone or any body, um, or the system does not work. For instance, imagine if there were two people that committed the identical crime under the identical set of facts, and one goes to one judge and the judge says, I'm going to give you 10 years and the other person goes to another judge and he says probation. That's not fair. That's not a system that's fair. So with respect to this commission's decision, it must be based on the facts of the case on a case-by-case -case basis. And the comparison of Mr. Johnson's case with Mr. Collard is that Mr. Johnson's case was actually much more egregious than Mr. Collard's. For instance, the placement of Mr. Johnson's camera was not in an easily accessible location. In fact, it was in the middle of nowhere. 
There were no roads nearby. There were no buildings nearby. There were no structures nearby. It was not near any water source. In fact, it was only discovered by happenstance by an informant. The informant indicated that he and a female acquaintance were hunting in the area when she took an easier route to where they wanted to go and stumbled upon the camera. It was not in a location that anyone would be expected to even go. This would suggest that this person knew that the camera was unlawful, but was trying to avoid detection. Again, that intentional element aspect of the violation, much like Mr. Robb. If the commission reviews the report of Mr. Johnson, it can see that his brother was working for a different outfitter than he was, and that his brother, the outfit that he worked for, harvested a large trophy animal in the area. Based on the facts of Mr. Johnson's case, a suspension of only five months was given. Five months. And that's C, page 54 of Mr. Collard's exhibits. That's the, the letter from Endow to Mr. Johnson regarding his suspension. NRS 501.181, which is exhibit two, or page three of Mr. Collard's exhibit, sets forth the duties of this commission. The very first duty that is set forth in the commission is that the commission shall establish broad policies and under subsection, subsection C shall promote uniformity of laws relating to policy uh, matters. So earlier when I mentioned that there should be equal justice and equal treatment, this is not just my opinion. This is actually a duty that is set forth that is not discretionary, but the statute says the commission shall promote uniformity of laws. Based on comparing Mr. Robb and Mr. Johnson's su suspensions, I've been talking a long time, I apologize. <laughs> I'm long-winded, lawyers usually are. I'll lighten the mood. Um, what's uh, 10,000 lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. Uh, I have more of those. See me after the meeting. I can share quite a few of them. So based on comparing Mr. Robb and Mr. Johnson's suspensions with the specific facts of Mr. Collar's suspension, it is clear that he is not being treated fairly by giving a three-year suspension. In fact, prosecuting Dylan Frainer was even willing to write a letter in support of Mr. Collard. Prosecutor uh, Frainer indicates, and if you all would please turn there, it's Exhibit 5 of the state's exhibit. He says, and I quote, in the past when I have prosecuted a guide or subguide for a violation of Nevada wildlife laws, the guide or subguide would receive a one-year suspension of their guiding privileges. I believed that the same would happen to Mr. Collard, and I believed that to be an appropriate punishment. I have been informed that instead of a one-year suspension, Endow has imposed a three-year suspension. Based on the facts, based upon the facts and Mr. Collard's cooperation in this case, I believe it is unjust, unjust is the word that he used to impose a three-year suspension of Mr. Collard, Mr. Collard's guiding license. I am writing to encourage this board to reduce the three-year suspension imposed on Mr. Collard by Endow to a one-year suspension. And this is the important part that I think that the, that the uh, uh, that the commission should consider. He says, uh, he concludes by saying that the one-year suspension is more in line with other cases that have come from his jurisdiction. Why that's important, again, is equal justice, uniform application of the laws pursuant to NRS 501.181. He is indicating that other cases that have come before him, it's one year. So we're comparing, again, we want to have equal justice, have everybody treated fairly. Uh, and I would just point out that this commission on at least one occasion has accepted the recommendation of a court and actually withdrew, not a suspension, but an, a revocation. Much more serious to have a revocation than a suspension. 
Suspension takes place after the fact. Revocation is, you're done right now, turn it in. You, no longer you can't do anything. And if the commission would turn to page 37 of Mr. Collard's exhibits, the guide here was convicted of a very serious- Mr. Collard, yes. I'm just gonna let you know you have five minutes to wrap up before we take our lunch break, or okay. we'll continue with you after lunch, but we are gonna take a, a lunch break at noon. I appreciate that, uh, Commissioner okay. or Chair, Chairwoman. I have I have some more time, so okay. um, it, we could just break for lunch. Well, we'll we'll give you the five minutes and then we'll break. We okay. have a hard stop at, at noon. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I will make sure that I am promptly finished at, uh, or I guess that we'll pause it at uh, noon. Okay. So if the, if the commission would please turn to page 37 of Mr. Collard's exhibits, it will see the revocation letter from the Division uh, of Wildlife. And this individual was charged with a very serious violation, NRS 207.260, which is unlawful contact with a child. Very serious stuff. Unlawful contact with a child. As such, his master guide license was not just suspended, but as mentioned, it was revoked. And Endow even suspended his sub guides license. So not only did they revoke his license, but they suspended his sub guides license. A couple of weeks later, the district judge that oversaw the criminal prosecution sent just an email to Endow indicating that he never intended to have his guide's license actually revoked. As a result of that recommendation from the judge, Endow withdrew the revocation of his guide license and allowed him to continue guiding. And here's the important part, and I think that the commission should do this with Mr. Collard. The commission strongly warned him that his conviction would be considered in the future if there were any other instance of misconduct. He was very strongly warned, you're gonna get your, your license reinstated, but if you ever have anything in the future, we're gonna consider that. And I think the commission can do that here. I think the commission can uh, reduce the, the penalty from three years to one with a very strong admonition to Mr. Collard, if you even sneeze wrong, pal, you're gonna get more than three years, you're gonna get five, and you may not even get it back after that. So, 11.58. So here, again, um, Mr. Collard is urging the commission to simply follow NRS 501.181 and administer equal justice by uniformly applying the laws as it has done in the past. Prosecutor Frainer believed that this prosecution would result in only a one-year suspension and not a three-year suspension, and his letter can and should be used as, uh, by the commission as it was done with the other guide. The commission can reduce from uh, three years to one, and also, again, as I mentioned, strongly warn Mr. Collard. Now, uh, Chairwoman East, I wanted to go through some of the other um, some of the other incidents, and I do believe that will take longer than two minutes, actually one minute now, so it, this would be a good time to break. Okay, all right, we'll go ahead and break now for lunch. It's 11.58, we'll come back, it's 11.59, we'll come back uh, at 1230. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very Thanks. much. Okay, at 12.30 and we'll come back to order and um, I believe Mr. Cloward was still in um, his evidentiary process, so. Thank you, Chair East, mm -hmm. Chairwoman East. Um, just give uh, Commissioner Weiss one moment. That's Take fine. your seat. Very important for her to hear this information as well. Okay. Okay, where we, where we finished off was uh, the recommendation of, of prosecuting attorney Dylan Frainer, uh, suggesting that one year would be uh, sufficient rather than, than uh, three year. And the fact that he used the word unjust, uh, he felt that the, that the 
three-year suspension was unjust is, is an important consideration. Now, I would like to go over some of the uh, suspensions that uh, have been made by this commission, or I guess upheld by this commission and made by uh, the, the division. In particular, uh, as I mentioned, I requested a 10-year history, basically a decade of any and all suspensions that have, that have been levied against any individual for the wildlife uh, violation of any sort or a, a crime. And that is pages 70 through 76 of Mr. Collard's exhibits. If the commission can turn there, 70 through 76 is the FOIA request. And again, I do offer thanks to Deputy Director Rob uh, and his staff uh, for assisting in gathering those documents. So pages uh, 70 through 76, the commission can see uh, the FOIA request that was made. And then after receiving those documents, what I did is I went through and I summarized uh, those documents for the commission's um, benefit. And I thought that it was important to compare a couple of things. Number one, what is the criminal penalty, if anything, for this particular violation at issue? Um, and what was the suspension and what were the facts underlying, underlying that particular suspension. I apologize, I, I misspoke. I believe that the summary is uh, page 70 through 76. Uh, the actual FOIA request itself was pages 10 through 11. That was the letter that I sent, 10 through 11. And then the documents right after 11 I believe uh, pages 13 or 14 through uh, 69, those are the responses and those are the responsive documents from all of the suspensions that have taken place in the last decade. And at the last hearing, um, one thing that was mentioned, Captain Creamer indicated that uh, Mr. Robb, Kyle Robb's suspension was, quote, middle of the road. and. You know, I want to push back on that a little bit because it actually, that's not accurate. That's not an accurate statement. Matter of fact, there's only been one other suspension for three years. One. And the suspension was for something very, very egregious. It involved uh, Tyler Brunson, and he actually obstructed, hindered, and interfered with the wildlife uh, investigative officer's investigation into a poaching case involving a trophy elk. So that case, Mr. Brunson obstructed, hindered, and interfered with an endow officer's investigation for a poaching case. And in fact, the underlying case, the two uh, individuals who shot the elk, Ryan Singler and Edwin Singler, if the commission looks, I included documents relative to those uh, convictions so that the commission can review that and see the seriousness of that offense. And in fact, um, Mr. Ryan Singler had to spend 270 days in jail. He had to pay a fine of $10,350. Edwin Singler spent 270 days in jail and he had to pay $9,350 in fines. In the past decade, that is the only suspension that was a three-year term, other than uh, Troy Robb. Now, when the commission reviews the other suspensions, it will see that other one-year suspensions that were levied for wildlife violations were even more egregious than Mr. Collard's. For instance, Mr. Egg was suspended for one year for violating federal law and operating a vehicle in the wilderness area. Uh, Mr. Sonderman was given one year when he was operating as a master guide in an area where a special use permit was required. Mr. Wright, as well as Mr. Whitney, they had three federal violations of using motorized vehicle in a wilderness area, violating BLM regulation, and violating conditions of special recreation permit, yet they were only given one year. And so very respectfully, Mr. Collard requests that he receive equal treatment and equal punishment under the law and ask this honorable commission to simply follow 
NRS 501.181 and administer equal justice by uniformly applying the law as it has done in the past. Now with respect to the, um, to the baiting charge, I'm going to reserve my discussion for that and I'm going to actually cross-examine uh, uh, Captain Creamer because I think there are very important issues that the Commission needs to review. But I'm going to wait until after the state presents its case on that issue. Okay. <clears throat> Do I need to move my stuff? I'm sorry, Chairwoman. Um, okay. You're going to go from there? Okay. Mr. Burkett, are you... So we're, are you cross-examining at this point or s submitting your evidence? So the, if you go back to the process, the process. that was the, the <clears throat> opportunity to call witnesses, et cetera. I think counsel indicates that he would like to cross-examine the witnesses that we call. And so at this point, we would be at the part of the process where we will call our witnesses. And I will call uh, Warden Giles. Okay. Yeah. And Warden Giles is going to be over here. So this will be a little different than what we've done before. I think a direct examination, a more formal direct examination is appropriate under these circumstances. So we'll just ask a few questions and walk him through a direct examination. Okay. So Warden Giles, can you just advise the commission of who you are? My name's Scott Giles, Eastern Region Investigator for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. How long have you been an investigator for the Department of Wildlife? Uh, January of 2018. What do you do as an investigator? Uh, I investigate the majority of my stuff underneath Title 45 for wildlife crimes. What were you before you were a wildlife investigator for the department? I was a field warden based out of Ely, Nevada. Okay. Um, and how long were you a warden? I've been a uh, game warden since January 2005. Okay. Um, can you just describe how you came to initiate an investigation in regard to what eventually became an investigation of Mr. Collard? On September 8th of 2020, uh, I received an anonymous voicemail of a uh, camera mounted in front of a blind in a uh, bait pile, uh, was a hay bale and a, some buckets at uh, Big Springs in Cave Valley. Mr. Giles, maybe move that mo microphone a little closer. You, uh, you're, you're a light speaker. I have that uh, same problem. Sorry, my apologies. What did you do after you became aware of it through this anonymous tip of this uh, circumstance? Uh, September 9th, I field checked the tip and uh, confirmed that there was a uh, camera mounted in front of the blind at Big Springs, uh, a hay bale, and some red buckets in a cardboard box. Snapped some photos of them. Uh, verified on the Onyx mapping system, the app on the phone, that we were on BLM ground, and uh, worked my way back out, contacted Warden Anderson for some help to go back in the next day to sit on that area. Okay, let's go back, because you said a lot there, and I don't know that the commission fully understood all that. Let, let's just talk about the mapping. Did you at some point become, uh, later become aware that the, well, let's, let's go back and ask a better question. How many cameras do you understand were in place uh, that you all investigated related to Mr. Collard? Uh, there were two. The first day I was there, I found one. Um, we managed to find another one later in the investigation. So the commission understands, relate uh, the location of the cameras, east, west, north, south, um, and then we'll go from there. Well, let's ask a better question. Was one of the cameras west of the other one? Yes. How far? Uh, approximately 50 to 75 yards. Okay. I, I Did can't say exactly for sure. Did you later become aware that one of the cameras was on private and one was on public land? I did after the case was submitted to the Lincoln County District Attorney. Um, Lincoln District Attorney called me and said, uh, 
their GIS person had mapped the uh, area on the quarter section, township range and quarter section, quarter section down, explained to me that the difference in the mapping between the map that Onyx had, the map that we got from the Lincoln County tax parcel map, and whatnot that uh, uh, private property went over to the section line, and so the section line would be in line with uh, the wilderness boundary as it shot north on the property. So the camera at the blind was actually on private when you um, map it out to the quarter sections. But the one that was at the spring head on the edge of the, to the west there, on the edge of the wilderness boundary was, was still in the area. It was public BLM land. Okay. So to be clear, you later determined one of those uh, cameras was on private and one was on public? Yes, after the case was submitted. All right. The bait, where was it located? Was it on private? Uh, learning afterwards, yes. It was on private um, due to the change in the mapping um, with the Lincoln County GIS person, but based on Onyx and the map that we got from their tax people at, at the courthouse in Lincoln County, we, and we thought we were on BLM, so it's good faith. Okay, is it, is it legal to place bait on private land? No. How long, to your knowledge, has that statute been in place regarding baiting? 2011 or 12, somewhere in there. I can't say for 100%. Okay, 2011, so I think. for at least a decade, it's been illegal to bait on private or public land. For big game animals, yes. All right, and so describe the bait that you saw. Uh, there was a, a alfalfa bale, so it looked like a mix, grass and alfalfa mix. Uh, there was a red tub with uh, like rolled oats and some cracked corn. Uh, the cardboard box contained a, uh, based on a label, was a uh, liquid supplement that you would use to, you know, livestock feeding application. It looked like it had been poured over the one bucket. Um, the other bucket had, I'm not 100% sure what they were, but they were some type of mineral chew or supplement. And then there was some type of a powdered mineral in that bucket. And then it looked like the sweet and glow mix, the stuff in the cardboard box had been poured on that. And then um, over along the bank of the pond, there were these uh, uh, pelleted feeds uh, that were just strung out along there, quite a few of them. A lot of, like you cut the end off the bag and just walked with it. Did you observe any livestock in the area? No, sir. Based on that, uh, did you form a conclusion as to what the bait was being used for? It was, uh, my training and experience would say that that was being uh, placed there to entice wildlife to stay in the area. What are your concerns with respect to use of this type of bait for wildlife when wildlife consume it? It's probably not the most healthy thing for them. Uh, and you think that's not their natural diet by any sense of the word. Um, they probably shouldn't eat mineral chews and things like that. The rumen's not designed to eat stuff that, for wildlife that we feed our domestic animals. And in a free range situation like that, we could have some issues with animals that we get a hold of it and become ill. To your knowledge, who placed the bait? Uh, in interview, Mr. Collard told us that he gave the bait to the caretaker and the caretaker on the property. What time frame was it that you observed the cameras up? Um, if you were there on different days, advise of that. What, what time frame did you see those cameras in place being used? Uh, between September 9, 2020 and September 16th. Okay. What, when were trail cameras supposed to be removed under regulation? August 1st. So how long were they up past regulation? <laughs> I'm going to have to take my boots off. Uh, 40, 40 day, 40. Five, four to six days. Okay. Did you come to be aware of whether 
the trail cameras were being used to assist in the um, Mr. Collard's guiding. On September 10th, I observed Mr. Collard and uh, another man that we later determined to his hunter, um, name of uh, Picor. Uh, they came into the area, um, took a tablet, went to the camera at the blind, plugged the tablet into it, looked at the tablet for a while, um, bailed out. Mr. Collar took the truck away from the blind up to the north. Uh, Mr. Picor got in the blind. Um, Mr. Collar came back, got in the blind, and they sat the blind that evening. I don't know if we informed the commission of this fact. Where was the camera that you just referenced pointed towards? Where was it directed towards? Uh, it would be towards the bait and uh, kind of the water going out that way, uh, so, out of the blind to the south. In other words, the camera was pointed towards the bait. If the animals had been consuming the bait, the, um, the camera would have captured that, theoretically. I would assume so, yes. Did you ever speak with Mr. Collard? On December 1st of 2020. And just describe what yes. he explained to you. No, we, uh, I interviewed him with Warden Anderson, um, showed him the uh, picture uh, in the blind, and he identified himself, identified Mr. Picor, and without prompting said that uh, that was at Big Springs, talked about it, and I showed him the maps and whatnot that I had that it was on public. Uh, Mr. Collard was uh, upset about that because he believed that um, the Jensen's had told him, uh, Pam and Bruce Jensen, the property owners in there, that he was on private. And I should, based on the maps I had, he wasn't. And, uh, but he, he took responsibility for it. Uh, I then asked him about um, the bait. And uh, first he said that was the Jensen's and then he recanted that and said, yeah, I gave it to the caretaker and had asked the caretaker to put it out and, um, and then owned it. Um, he, he said that, yeah, that's my responsibility. I, I take ownership of it. Uh, next we kind of asked him about, you know, if he had Onyx on his phone and, and uh, he said he did, but didn't always download the maps before going out and, and all that. And uh, it was a cordial interview. Um, I told him that I would uh, submit a report to the Lincoln County District Attorney and the Lincoln DA would make the uh, judgment of what would happen then. Just to be clear, had Mr. Collard indicated to you that he did or did not use, I, I think you just said it, but I want to make clear, that he did or did not use his Onyx map to determine if the proper, if the bait it and the cameras were on public or private? He stated that he had it on there, but didn't always use it because he didn't always download the maps beforehand. We did not get into the specifics of that. What conclusions did you draw as to whether Mr. Collard had engaged in violations of Nevada wildlife laws? The, at that moment in time, uh, I believe that there were two cameras on public property and, and the bait on, in, that was being used as well. So there was an NAC for camera use after the 1st of August that was violated and an NAC that was violated for bait being placed out and actively hunted over because that's a two-part regulation. Okay, thank you. No more questions. Just a couple follow-up. Uh, yes, sir. Warden Giles, I appreciate your time here today. Uh, the spring head that you mentioned uh, was on after after you determined it actually was on BLM. Is that accurate? That is what Mr. Frainer told me. Okay. And have you seen the photograph, uh, this this printout, uh, which is basically a topo map of the uh, of the spring? No, sir. Okay. May I've I, never may seen I, that photo before. May I approach your witness counsel? Sure. Okay. Oh, watch. Missed it. Warden Giles, where does it appear to you that that spring head is located, on public or private? I'm making the assumption here that the uh, black line is the uh, property boundary. Correct. Yes. Well, where they mark the spring on the map would be inside. Where the originating point is is going to be on the boundary by the looks of it.
mark that. But the toes might be lying right there, so. Okay. Where does the round dot that looks like it's the spring appear to be? It's in the inside the black bunker. What evidently is private on this map. So that would be in the private, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, uh, you agree, at least according to that document, uh, the spring appears to be on private, true? Yes, sir. Okay. And I wanted to ask a, a question about your interview with Mr. Collard. Um, you indicated that Mr. Collard was upset because he thought that uh, he was within the law. I wouldn't specifically say that. My, my thoughts on it were that he was upset at the Jensen's for telling him things that, according to the documents I had showed him, were inaccurate. To me, that was, that's what I would say. He was upset at them more than he was upset at me or anything like that, based on the maps I showed him. That's sure. what I would say my, my thoughts were in there, sir. Understood, but basically that he had relied improperly, he made a mistake in relying on what the Jensen's had told him with respect to their property boundaries. That would be your question. Sure. Um, when you interviewed Mr. Collard, he, he seemed to be upset uh, that he had relied on information that uh, he had received from the Jensen's. True? Yes, sir. Okay. And one of the things that he had received from the Jensen's was information about their boundary line. True? Yes, sir. And I believe just a moment ago you testified that um, he was upset because he thought that he was on private property. Yes, sir. Okay. So this wasn't a situation where he said to you, ah, you know what, I just didn't think I was going to get caught. We did not have those discussions, but I also apprised him that uh, bait doesn't matter if it's private or property, sir. I understand. But the information that, that he provided to you did not uh, evince a knowledge that he had that the baiting was actually illegal and he was trying to get around the statute, true? He was stoic. I can't say if he was misleading me or not. Mm. Okay. Um, in your investigation, did you ever receive any information at all that Mr. Collard knew that it was illegal to put bait out on private property? Nothing says that one way or the other, but it is his responsibility to know the regulations and the statutes for Title 45, which is wildlife law. 100% and I agree with that. He definitely has an obligation to understand that. There's no question there. We're not disputing that. We're not disputing that at all. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about some of that in my, in my closing. But um, with respect to the Onyx maps and so forth, let's just say that you, let's just say that it was judge, jury, and executioner right there on the spot when you interviewed him, uh, your initial determination was that both cameras were on public, true? Yes, sir. And that was a mistake, true? For one, yes. Okay. For the other one, according to the Lincoln County District Attorney, I'll still hold that he claimed that that camera was on um, public property, so I'll, I'll hold with that knowledge. Sure. I hope you understand that, because I have no other verification of your map or anything else. I'm going on what he told me. Understood. But at the end of the day, what it was determined was that one of those cameras was in fact on private and one was on public, true? Yes, sir. Okay. So if at the moment that you interviewed Mr. Collard, you were the judge, jury, and executioner, you would have determined that both of those should have been charged and that would have been a mistake. Is that not correct? Yes, that would be. Okay. That would have been a, for, for what you learn after the fact, yes, sir. And it's a mistake just like Mr. Collard? for putting the camera out there in the first place thinking that it was on private, true? I'm not to say one way for other for Mr. Collard. I can speak for myself, but sure. not him. Okay. And you agree that there was conflicting information with respect to the, uh, the sources of information uh, regarding the boundary lines, correct? Yes, and I can tell you, sir, in good faith, I ran two separate maps, okay. and that's what I made my judgments on, and I submitted the case based on that. 
And when I was found to be incorrect on that, hey, I own it. I have no questions no, 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 owning no. it. So I'm, I'm not criticizing your investigation at all. At all. I think you did everything above board. No complaint there. No, thank you. Uh, no complaint there. I think you did a fine job. All I'm trying to, to point out is, is that the, the boundary line, there's an issue with the boundary line. Okay? Yes, sir. And it's a reasonable, reasonable position that Mr. Collard uh, thought that he was on private land. That's it. Uh, Warden, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Excuse me, just one moment. Does the commission have they the can't. ability Any to Any questions that you ask guys have. Of, okay, so mm -hmm. if the commission has questions for, for Mr. Giles, please feel free to ask at this time. Any questions for Warden Giles? No. This is your opportunity. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Giles, with, with regards to the property ownership, um, there was some information in the, the department packet that indicated that the Jensen's did not own the property at the time of the, the violations. Is that right? You, you had communicated with the BLM? Oh, okay. I know. Um, th that is not um, private property versus the BLM. That was for um, the livestock grazing permit and the water right at Big Springs because in the trail camera law, you have the... Um, exception that's built in for livestock permittees to make sure that the Rock and 13 Sunnyside Ranches, which was Pam and the deceased Bruce Jensen, that was their, um, they had had that allotment before, but I had heard that it had passed over, so I contacted the Bureau of Land Management and received that document from them stating that the CE Racket Cap Company had purchased those allotments and then for the water right, in the packet I believe was provided to you, there's a the statement from the State Water Engineer's Office for Big Springs that it's underneath CE Bracket Cattle Company. And so those two exceptions on the camera were ruled out to be anything on the Rock and 13 Sunnyside Ranches. That's what that is. It has nothing to do with private property versus BLM. It was the grazing permits that go into some of the exceptions in that regulation. So the Jensen still owned the property? Yes, they own the private property. Just, okay, so so I guess I haven't seen anything that indicated um, that, that permission had been granted by the Jensen's. Um, there was communication, apparently, um, you know, saying keep this information so in case you get questioned. Um, is there any documentation anywhere that shows us that, that there had been permission to put these cameras on private property? I do not have any documentation I can provide to you that I just know through general knowledge in the hunting community that uh, Mossback Guides and Outfitters has worked with um, tags, incentive elk tags, with that landowner in the past. So I can say that, but the, beyond that, I did not provide anything. So Mr. Collard and I never discussed that in our interview. So does the, does the, the code or, or require written permission or does it require just permission. I don't. I'm. I think it just says permission. Okay. So I guess we have to make some assumptions along. Okay. Um, okay. I think that was that was helpful. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Giles? Okay. Thank you. I would just ask a follow-up clarifying question uh, that may assist uh, Commissioner McNich. Mm -hmm. uh, Warden Giles, there was never any attempt to uh, add a trespassing charge on this case, true? Yeah, no attempt and no reasons or issues to. Okay. And uh, to your knowledge, uh, uh, isn't it true that Mr. Collard actually asked either you or Warden Anderson to accompany him out to, to speak directly with uh, Bruce Jensen? But uh, the, the response was, Bruce Jensen ha has kind of a temper issue, so we're not going to go out and talk to him. I remember we talked about something like that, but uh, I can't recall it exactly. Okay. But, but certainly, uh, Mr. Collard was, was uh, trying to get uh, the commission, or excuse me, the, uh, <coughs> the state to go out and actually interview and talk to Mr. Jensen. Isn't that true? I would not say that there was a demand for that. We discussed it, as I didn't have any need to speak with him, and that was that. Okay, you did discuss it, though, true? 
he asked me if uh, something, well, you need to go talk to Bruce or something like that. But it, it, sorry, sir, that was December 1 of 20, and I don't fully recall. Completely understand. Thank you. Key, okay, the respondents will call uh, Warden John Anderson. Just a moment. Oh. Oh, sorry. Commissioner Allenberg. You're good. You're good. He's still up. He's still on the, on the seat. Yeah, I guess I, I want a, a clarification um, for my own understanding of who, who actually owns the, 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 the property now and the water rights now uh, and at the time of the violation. The property is owned by the Jensen's, the private property. The grazing permit and the water right is the CE um, bracket cattle LLC. It's in the, at the time of the violation in 20. Their grazing permit began March 1 of 2020, I believe. And I don't, I want to say the water right was recorded in August of 20, but I have to look in here to verify that for sure for you, sir. If you would like, I could. I would, I'd like a, you know, to be you know, clear in my mind on the water rights ownership of that date and who would have the right to have that camera on that water right at that date. Let's see, yeah, it is next to the most good thing. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yes? Yep, 2020 to owners CE bracket cattle company in the Cave Valley sub -basic. Understood. Thank you. I'm okay. Commissioner McGinch. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'd like to ask another question if I could. So was there, during your conversations with Mr. Collard, was there any indication um, You'd been informed that they had been uh, asked by the Jensen's to watch for, to see the monitor the use of on their property. I'm assuming from big game, is that right? I mean, that was in one of the one of the discussions that you'd occur, uh, had that he'd indicated that he'd been asked to uh, to monitor use of the property. So, was there any conversation about why there was bait and why there was a blind there that? Mr. Collard and I don't know if it was a client or another individual would be in um, at that particular site. I mean, is this part of their monitoring or was there other, um, what else, what was going on? Was there any conversation about that at all? Well, I, I, it was part of, uh, part of the interview, I thought. Mr. Maybe Giles, can you just go back so we get you on the microphone? Uh, you know, there's there's an there's an awful lot of information here, a lot of stuff to sift through. So yeah. um, everybody's going to have to bear with us while we try to, at least with me, while I try to put things in perspective. I mean, you know, there's hundreds of pages of stuff up here. So. And I recall what you're 
asking about too, Commissioner McNinch, because uh, I have the same question, but I don't recall who. Oh, it is. Okay. And we'll so get we'll to that. Up, Sorry. We'll ask that <laughs> Warden Anderson. No okay. Problem. Any other questions for Warden Giles? Giles. Giles. Giles, like a Giles. Giles I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. And I have some follow up, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Sure. Okay. Um, I want to clarify what this uh, what this watering right does, this grazing right, versus private property. Okay. If a spring is located on private property, the state does not have the authority or ability to convey a water right to another individual. Is that correct? You're beyond my knowledge, sir. Okay. Um, you agree that the private property ownership is different than a grazing permit that is allotted or allowed by the state of Nevada? Grazing permits are not allowed by the state of Nevada. That's a federal government thing. The... Um, so I'm kind of confused on your question, sir. Sure. The, the grazing permit is different. It allows for a, a rancher to use uh, the, the public land to have their cattle or their livestock on public land, correct? Yes. It doesn't convey a right to go on someone's private land, correct? I, I still am not. You get a BLM permit to run your cattle, okay, I, I'm not following. The, the BLM permit is to run cattle on BLM land, correct? Yes, sir. It's not, hey, I have this BLM permit and now I can go on to somebody's private land, correct? <clears throat> We're a fence out state, sir. If you don't want somebody's cows on your place, you need to pinch your property. Well, I, I think we're, we're talking about two different issues. If I have a grazing permit, that doesn't mean that I can go on to Commissioner Allenberg's private property doesn't convey to me that right. Isn't that true? If his property is opened and, and it's not fenced, I, that's why I'm not following you because I do kind of understand the cattle end of the world. I grew up in it. Yeah. So, so that's too. why I'm struggling with you. <laughs> yeah. If Mr. Almberg or Commissioner Almberg, say for instance, or Commissioner McNitch, if they, if they fence off their property just because somebody has a uh, a grazing permit for BLM land, that doesn't mean that their cattle can go on those private properties, true? Yeah, if it's fenced off, that's trespass, yes, sir. Okay. I don't have any other clarifying questions. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Mr. Burkett? We'll call, we'll call Warden Anderson. Okay. Mr. Anderson, please. Come on up. Good job with the microphones. Thank you. Please state your name. My name is John Anderson. Who do you work for? In the Nevada Department of Wildlife. And what do you do for the department? I'm a game warden of 10 years, stationed out of uh, Lincoln County, Pamaca. Okay. Uh, have you been involved in prior investigations regarding wildlife um, <clears throat> issues? Yes. Uh, throughout the last 10 years, Working as a game warden, many investigations, many, yeah. Did you receive training for that? Yes, I've <clears throat> received wildlife investigations classes uh, throughout the United States, continuing education through the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Please share with the Wildlife Commission how you became involved in the investigation with Mr. Collard. Um, I received a phone call from Game Warden Investigator Scott Giles on the 9th of September, and he basically laid out to me the tip that he had, and knowing how he was going to investigate it through covert watching the scene, he wanted a uniformed patrol officer to be there in case contact needed to be made. And so I kind of hung back and stayed in radio contact in case I needed to come in and make contact in uniform. 
So just to, just share with the commission, if you can, what you did as part of your investigation. Um, on the 9th, I'm going I'm to pause just so I can make sure I can be on track. Hold on. I just want to clarify. What you're doing is reviewing your final report that you wrote as it relates to this investigation? Yes. And you're doing that to help refresh your memory? Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead. So the, on the 9th, a phone call was made to me. He asked me to come out on the 10th. Um, I parked my patrol vehicle approximately one mile as the crow flies from Big Spring on a little side road. Um, if you were to drive it, it'd probably be about two miles. Um, hit my patrol truck. Um, after Giles did his, Officer Giles did his investigation, we met up. He showed me what he was dealing with, explained the situation. Um, he then showed me photographs of, that he had taken of the hunters coming in. And I also knew, personally knew Russell Collard and was able to identify his truck and um, him personally from the photographs that were taken. Um, so then the next morning we decided to come back and do it again, expecting them to be in the blind again and see them hunting over the bait again. I remained there till about 900 hours and then I left um, because because of the fact that we knew that Onyx isn't always 100% reliable, we wanted to get a second source of mapping. And so I went to Lincoln County, spoke with um, the Lincoln County tax parcel people um, that put out the Lincoln County tax parcel viewer. They showed me a bunch of maps. Every map that I saw at that point told us that the, both of those cameras were on public land both of the cameras in question. Um, and so I printed off one of those maps, brought it back. And do you want me to just keep going through my report? Yeah, let me just back up though. I want to make sure I understand. Did you indicate you saw Mr. Collard and the hunter in the blind? Physically, no. Okay. No, I, I saw the photographs that Officer Giles had, Game Warden Giles had presented to me. How did you understand he came across those photographs? Um, by getting an advantage point, knowing that there might be hunting activity going on because there was an open bull elk hunt and the evidence that he had seen, and then hiding and taking photographs of the location once the people had entered the, the location. And this the was over the blind that included the bait in front of it? Yes. And it included the camera in front of the blind? The whole, from his location he could see the whole spring and, and the blind and the trees and the, all the bait and the everything okay go ahead describe what you did next okay um so after getting the second mapping source um the next day on 9 13 um at approximately 12 30 hours we went in the middle of the day expecting that there would be no no one there middle of the day based on how hunters hunt because we really wanted to get a good look at the bait and some different things. So I drove in uh, to the spring, went and looked at the blind, went and looked at the cameras, could see that the rocking 13 emblem on both cameras. Um, went and looked at the, the bait site, um, took photographs of all the different types of bait and took evidentiary samples of each one so we could de definitely determine that these were in violation of the law. Um, and yeah, after, after that, I left the area. And the next part of my involvement in the case was when we interviewed uh, Russell Collard in December. Did you say you took photographs of the bait? Yes. Can you walk through with the commission uh, the commission has photographs in front of them, and uh, what's the first page of that? Actually, I don't know if you have it. Um, it's documents that were provided to the commission this morning. Um, I think it says Big Spring on the front of it. Uh, I had removed a bunch of photographs from that. There it is, yeah. So I know Miss Wise has it there. Um, all right, 
so just walk with us through those photograph, those documents and identify, first of all, take a look at the exhibit and tell us if those were photographs taken by you. Yeah, yes, I took each of these photographs. Okay. Go to the first document, if you could, and describe what that is. Uh, I'm guessing that's this one. Okay, um, identify what it says on it. Camera placed on branch in front of blind. Okay, and what is that? Um, it's a picture of a camera box, which is locked to protect the camera, a trail camera, and then the camera is pointed out at the baiting site. And is this the camera that you observed uh, on site? Yes. What's the significance of the Rocking 13 insignia? That's the brand of Bruce Jensen and the Jensens. Did you understand why Mr. Collard's name was not on the cameras? Um, I'm trying to remember if we had that conversation. And I, off the top of my head, I can't remember whether he told me why it was Rocking 13. I can draw conclusions. But. Okay. All right, um, what's the next photograph? It's just a close-up of the same, same exact thing. And what camera is it? Camera in a box. It's a trail camera placed in a box to protect it with the Rocking 13 emblem on it. Right, yeah. right behind this, you'll see it in subsequent photographs, is the blind. So it's hidden kind of inside of a juniper tree. All right, and this is the, the trail camera that was, we later determined was on private? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, what's the next photograph? Just whenever, whenever we take evidentiary photos, we like to do three, overview, mid-view, and then a close-up. So this is the close-up of the exact same. Okay, next camera. photograph. The other side showing the lock. S same camera? Same camera, same okay. spot. You, next can, you can start to see the blind in behind it. Okay, next photograph. Next photograph's me standing in front of that, so the camera would have been off to the left, and then there's two chairs inside of there, inside of the blind. Okay, next photograph. Um, from the back looking towards the water, and I think you can see my patrol truck in the background, and then just to the right of that would have been the bait. So the, the grain that we described earlier, that Officer Giles described earlier that was dumped out, was dumped out around that pond. Okay, thank you. Next photograph. Another photograph of the back of the blind. Okay, next photograph. So this is the trail camera that was later to determined to be on public land. It's at the spring head. Okay. Very top of the spring. And next photograph. Oh, no, it, that's not, that's good, okay. Let me ask you, um, you, did you take evidence from the scene? I did, yeah. Okay. Yes. Can you just show the commission the evidence that you took? And this is evidence related to the bait? Yeah, this is a, a sample from each um, bait that was there, each type of bait. It was a very elaborate. I've never seen another baiting site as elaborate as this one. What do you mean when you say that? Just usually there's a salt block or just something small, maybe a little bit of hay. This was entire bales, hundreds of pounds of, of grain. I mean, monetarily, it would have been hundreds of dollars worth of grain. Okay. So really elaborate baiting site. Is um, this the most elaborate baiting site you've ever seen? Yes, by far. Okay. Um, this is one of the apples that were there that we... It's inside of here. I can open it up, but now it's probably leather because it's been in there for two years. But this is one of the apples. Um, this one is alfalfa hay, just a sample of the alfalfa hay that was there. This one is the grain that was poured on and around the whole area. Um, what kind of grain? Um, I, uh, some kind of dairy, something that you would honestly probably feed a goat. I don't know the name of it. Okay. Um, this is the big mineral chews. There was uh, the big red, red buckets that cattlemen and equestrian people use. I mean, they're almost half, three quarters of the way full of these kind of biscuits. What are those biscuits used for? 
that Scott maybe spoke to it better. I'm, I'm, I didn't grow up raising cattle or anything, so some kind of treat for horses, I would think. Okay. And then this one is oats with that sweet and glow molasses-y minerally mixture poured on top of them. So, yeah. That's Do you understand like the there. purpose? What's the purpose of the molasses? Uh, probably a scent attractant um, to bring in animals to the bait site. Okay. Anything else? And not on the bait. That's all the samples of the bait that I was able to collect. Okay. Were you able to determine, or how were you able to determine that the, the one of the cameras was on public? Uh, like was stated before, our initial impression was that both were there. Um, it wasn't until um, the district attorney's office went to their GIS people that they said, hey, wait, maybe we know that this one was probably, or most definitely, on private land. But we were also able to determine, even from that mapping, that the second camera was at least 25 yards on to public land. Did you ever gather information about um, Mr. Collard's client? Who, who was his client? Uh, just through open source Instagram, through their site, we were able to see um, a man named, I don't even know his first name, Trey. I don't know if that is his real name, but Trey Pecor. Where, was, where is he from? From my understanding, he's from Vermont. Was he successful in harvesting an animal? Uh, according to Instagram, they posted a photograph of him holding a bull elk that was killed that year under the Mossback name. Had you ever previously interacted with Mr. Collard? Yes. How many occasions? Uh, many. I, I couldn't give a number. Did you have a discussion with Mr. Collard regarding the Garrett Johnson investigation? Yes, we spoke on the phone. I was the primary investigator on that case as well. Um, I called him to see if he knew that Garrett Johnson had been placing cameras on public land once I determined that it was one of his sub-guides who had placed bait and cameras on public land. Um, and so I called him to ask him if he had known about it. Um, he stated to me that he did not know that he said we paid him to put cameras out on public land um, before the closure, but he had no idea that he had continued to run them or that he was using bait. Was he concerned about the use of bait? Yes. How did he express that to you? He was, said he was disappointed in Mr. Johnson. In the fact um, that he used bait? The fact that he used cameras and bait after the time, and he said that's not what we do. Did he indicate to you, based on that experience, did you have the understanding that he knew it was inappropriate to place bait? Yes. Against the law? Yes. No more questions. Yeah, just, just really quick. Um, Warden, how are you? Good. Good. So can you tell the commission, did you actually have a conversation with Russ Collard about uh, Garrett Johnson placing bait and the distinction between private and public land? I can't say that the distinction was made in that conversation that this was definitely public and that it would have been le that this was definitely public land and if they would have done it on private land that half of that issue would have been null and void if that makes sense. Yeah. Essentially you didn't talk about private land with Mr. Collard because the fact that Garrett Johnson put out bait it was actually on private land or public land. Yeah, there no was no question about it, it was well on public land, not even close to private source, isn't that true? That area is School Marm Basin, there's no public land in School Marm Basin. Okay, so there's not even a private element to Mr. Johnson's prior issue, true? True. Okay, so it's fair to say uh, you, you didn't have a discussion with Mr. Collard about uh, the legality of placing bait on public versus private land during that conversation because Private land was not even an issue, true? True. Okay. Now, with respect to Mr. Collard's client, 
uh, and the photograph that you saw on Instagram. Uh, it's fair to say that, that you as well as uh, Warden Giles continued to surveil uh, Mr. Collard uh, toward the end of the hunt, true? True. And you never saw them harvest this, uh, do anything inappropriately, true? True. As a matter of fact, if you would have seen them do anything inappropriate, you would have charged them with that, true? True. Now, Warden Anderson, you know that I like you, and I, I, but I've got to do my job. Uh, Get it done. So, one thing that I want to talk about is uh, a report that was prepared and provided to me just nine days ago. You familiar with your draft report? Yes. Okay. You agree that that was not provided to Mr. Collard during the pendency of his criminal investigation, true? You talking about my rough draft? Yes. Yes, that was not provided. It was not meant to be. And uh, you would agree that Mr. Collard should have the right to all of the evidence uh, that the state may or may not have against him, true? I do not believe that Mr. Collard should have the right to my rough draft of my report. Okay, even if your rough draft contains the name of a witness who may exonerate uh, part of Mr. Collard's claim? That, that was a confidential informant, and it was in my rough draft as a note for myself, and that confidential informant was removed to protect him and the fact that that report ended up being given to you guys is, and wasn't what was meant to happen. You, are you familiar with the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America? Yes. You agree that the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America guarantees the rights of an individual who have been charged with a crime, the right to an impartial jury, the right to know your accusers, and most important, to know the nature of charges and evidence against them. Yes, and if that would have come out in a trial, we have ways of divulging who a confidential informant is, and that would have happened, but it never went to trial. Uh, you agree that with respect to the prosecution of Garrett Johnson, the confidential informant in that case that found, uh, that stumbled upon the bait, that name was actually provided to me, true? I don't know. It was? You know him, right? You know him well. Remember, he was going to come down and testify. Mr. Cloward. Yeah. I'm not going to tolerate that. Tolerate what? The harassing. Let's move on. Well, I think this is very it's not. critical it, to the for case. For us, we need to hear the evidence. Okay, this, this is, is not evidence. You understood. Understood, Madam Chair. I'll move on. Thank you. Um, Warden Anderson, you agree that in your report, there is a name by the name, uh, an individual. True. We spoke about him earlier, not using his name. Okay. Understood. And this individual, according to your draft report, which was not provided to the commission or to me until nine days ago, um, actually admitted that he had placed some of the bait, true? At the request of Russell Collard, yes. He indicated he had placed some of the bait, true? At the request of Russell Collard, yes. Okay. And he also indicated that there were other individuals that were hunting over that, true? Mossback subgets, yes. Can you show me in your, in your draft report where it says that? Or it says what? Explain that again. Mossback subguides. That there were other Mossback subguides that were there? Yeah. It is not in my report. Okay. That would be an important detail for the commission to consider, don't you think? The crime that occurred, the individual that we saw hunting over the bait at any time was only one individual. Okay. The only reference, I don't, I don't know who those other people are. He just said there were some other people he didn't know who they were. Okay, so other people that he didn't know who they were that were hunting in that area? Yes. Okay, yet that information was not provided to Mr. Collard to use in his criminal uh, proceedings, correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, do you know whether your draft report has been provided to members of the commission? It was. Okay. Um, 
if I could have the commission turn to page uh, exhibit seven. I just want to make sure that that draft report was in the provided. It, 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 the last time I looked at it, which was 30 minutes ago, it was in the information that was provided to me by Linda that was, she said was given to everybody, so. <clears throat> is, is there a report that is a supplemental report that is dated July 22nd, 2020? Okay, perfect. Is there also a report that is dated February 1, 2021? Okay, just wanted to make sure the commission had both of those. Um, Warden, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Oh, one other question. In the draft report, um, it indicated that you asked the individual uh, sign a witness statement, correct? Yes. And he told you that he would fill it out, true? True. But he never did, correct? He never did. And based on your experience, when an individual talks to you and indicates certain information, uh, but they're unwilling to fill out a report, what does that suggest? Fear of repercussions. Uh, fear of repercussions for themselves? Yes. Or potentially uh, that what they've told you is not accurate? No, he expressed fear of repercussions from Mossback. Is there a reason why that didn't make it into your draft report? Because I'm trying to protect him and his reasonable fear. Okay. Um, in your actual report, is there a reason that you didn't even identify that you had spoken to this individual and just referenced them as a quote-unquote confidential informant? Yes, to protect him. Okay. I understand that you want to protect him, but... Uh, there was no mention of this individual in the final report, true? In the final report, no. And that information... The district attorney was well aware of him and was willing to disclose him as an individual if we needed him in trial. Okay. And have you, have you seen the disclosure from prosecuting attorney Frainer? I have not. Okay. I've showed that to uh, Dag Burkett. It does not list any individual that, who is a confidential informant as a potential witness. Were you aware of that? I was not. Okay. No further questions. I, I just have a couple to direct. Okay. Just to be clear for the commission's understanding, it's illegal to bait on private or public land, correct? That's correct. And it's also illegal to feed wildlife, correct? It is. Okay, no more questions. Thank you. Does the commission have any questions of uh, Warden Anderson? Vice Chair Cabilia? Uh, yes, uh, Warden Anderson, just, and uh, Warden Giles brought it up as well. I just want to confirm with you, you were in the, when you guys interviewed, you had Russ Collard came in, to, came in in December, I believe, of that year, and you guys interviewed him? Yes. And at that time, based upon Warden Giles's uh, testimony he he admitted that he set the cameras he admitted that he directed the the caretaker to place the bait correct yes okay I just want to confirm you you had the same recollection as Warden Giles um, so we have uh, Russell Collard admitting that he did that and then also since his name has been brought up now said that he was told to put that stuff out there I just want to confirm that. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. So kind of along those same lines, so was there any indication in your conversations with Mr. Collard on why he asked the caretaker to put out bait and or why he was using the blind to monitor usage of the field with the trail cams? Can you say that one more time? Sorry. Uh, the... Was there any indication in your conversations with Mr. Collard, was there any um, conversation regarding why he'd asked the caretaker to put out the bait? No, but that conversation was had with. Okay. And was there any, um, did, so he, he relayed why he was asked to do it? Yes. Are you able to share that with us? I'd rather not. 
the um, the other question was uh, you were originally told when you approached Mr. Collard about the trail cams that were placed out there, whether they're on private property or otherwise, it doesn't matter to me in my mind at this point, that they were out there to monitor um, use, to, to, met, to monitor use. Was there any discussion on why, um, why he was using a blind in that same area with bait present with, with uh, other people present? I don't, I don't remember that ever conversation being had where it was spoke of that those cameras were, were to monitor cattle use. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Well, or, or use, just use. Um, Cause he, 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 he uh, informed in the text uh, with you early on, uh, this was on uh, December 1st, 2020. Um, he had asked, uh, I'm only asking because a few of the farmers are wanting me to leave camp so they can see the usage. So I'm wondering where the, uh, you know, if he's out there monitoring usage for uh, of the, the private property um, with the trail cams, if there was any conversation about why uh, he and a, somebody else, a client possibly, I don't know if, if, if we know that for sure, uh, were in a blind uh, watching bait. Um, well, we were able to identify the individual that was with him in the blind as a client as Trey Pecor. That was a positive identification that was made. Um, but I don't recollect that conversation being had. Okay. Trying to understand why, how that would come into monitoring the field, the usage of the field. I guess I'm just trying to understand that. So, Commissioner, may I ask him a follow-up that may provide clarification on that? Yeah, but let's make it quick because we're already way into this. Certainly. We have a, I think we have a stop at three. Understood. Uh, Warden Anderson, there was a photograph of uh, an actual bow, uh, an archery bow in, in one of the, uh, the blind photographs, true? I, I, I don't recollect that. Are you talking about Officer Giles' photograph yes. that he took? Yes. I'd have to see it in front of me. I don't recollect that. Okay. Um, Commissioners, I believe in one of the packets, there's a, there's a picture of a photograph with a bow. Um, Mr. Collard never has denied that they were there for hunting. Uh, they were hunting over, over this uh, bait and in the blind. Uh, there's no question about that. That's no dispute there. He'll admit to that. Um, but uh, Warden Anderson, Mr. Collard never tried to deny that, correct? No. And he never said, hey, we're we're actually out here looking at cattle or anything like that, correct? No, he was, I'll be the first to admit, he was very cooperative, very owning up to the issues. It, the, the dispute was whether he could lawfully do that on private property, correct? Correct. Okay, and he had a misunderstanding uh, as to what the law provided. Yeah, I, that'd be up to, you'd have to ask him, but well, he relayed to us the fact that he thought that that was legal to set cameras on private land. And as was established before, we did have that conversation where I told him it's legal, but I don't remember talking about bait. Understood, but as far as your interview with him and Sergeant Giles at the Panaka field office, uh, your understanding was that um, he, was, he was upset because he, he thought he was within his rights to be doing exactly what he was doing. Is that fair? Yes. And there was, there was no attempt to, to conceal this information, to conceal the bait, to hide the bait. I mean, I think you testified it was an elaborate bait site, correct? Yes. So they weren't trying to do this in, in some sort of a secretive way. Is that fair? The only secretive issue that we saw was um, all the private property signs that were posted coming into the area that maybe would have deterred people from utilizing that road and ever seeing the issues. But that's, that's uh, speculation on your part. He never voiced that, did he? No, he never voiced that. Okay. Uh, no further. I, hopefully that clarifies Commissioner McNich. Commissioner McNich and then Commissioner Allenberg. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So I, guess I, so I guess this is, I feel like there's information that would help us with this. And I understand, is there, I hate to walk away from it, but I'm, I will out of respect for the, for the process and for your informant, if you will. Um, how do we work 
through that. Um, sounds like there might be some information that's relevant to this from our standpoint. You know, I'm curious of what he was told, you know, and why he was told to put that stuff there. Um, because it because it indicates to me um, the term willful and uh, knowingly was all part of the conversation earlier. And, um, you know, I, I just want to understand why those things were put there because it has everything to do with why those camera those trail cams were there and how we are consistent egregious um, less egregious you know all that kind of stuff that's why I that's why I was probing as I'm trying to get to the bottom of why um, it's just my gut feeling I'll throw it out there is it's pretty elaborate I have, a, I have a perception of a lot of elaborate things going on here, and I'm trying to work through that and beyond that and try to be fair, but I'm having a hard time with it. So I'll let the rest of this thing play out. Um, if I can just respond really quickly to Commissioner McNinch. Um, you know, we, we're sitting here today to hear the one count of the trail camera that was on public land and the baiting. Those are the two things that we have to determine, and I think you can assume why it was there at, at the time. Um, but it's illegal debate, so regardless of whether it was elaborate or a little bit, it's illegal. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Olmberg, and I didn't mean to be preaching at you. I just want to remind everybody, we're, we're up here, it's really intense, I get that, and for all of us, and I just want to make everybody feel reassured that we're up here for, for two reasons. Thanks. Uh, yeah, first off, I got a couple. Um, do you mind if I answer one of your questions? Absolutely. Um, when you ask about why somebody may not uh, sign a witness, sure. I, I can tell you why I didn't. Okay. Is because I got, I've been involved twice. And the first time I signed it and come out, <laughs> uh, I was, it was an afterthought. I, I wish it, I'm glad I did. I'm glad it went through. But this certainly made you nervous about uh, repercussions of who your finger, you know, who there. The second time, I didn't sign it. I did report it. I didn't sign it because of the first time, because of that, that fear of retribution. Understood. For, for, for me personally. And then the question uh, I have uh, to, to either you or uh, 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 Scott uh, Giles is, was the question ever asked, did he have permission from the current uh, CL Bracket Company to place those cameras there. And I'm assuming that's whose cows, who would have asked him to do that for, whose cows should have been grazing. So was that question ever asked? Uh, uh, the CL Bracket Company could never have given permission to put cameras on private property. So there is a private property exemption written into the camera law. So if, that, if that's what you're asking, if I am, I guess I want to make myself clear. Um, so the people that have the permission on water is uh, the water rights. That's what becomes the private property. That's why they are allowed to put the camera there. My There's an exemption written into the camera law for uh, cattlemen to be able to monitor their cattle. Correct. I'm trying to recall from our discussions when we did the trail cam rule and why there was an exemption because there's a lot of times they have water yeah. rights out there in on BLM land. If they still have the ability to, to put their cameras, they run their cattle there, they still are able to put their uh, trail cameras up there for monitoring their cows. So I'm assuming this bracket has the ability, is, is the one that actually has the ability. His cows are the ones that are supposed to be on that water right. And he has the authority to uh, monitor his cattle. And I can't answer the question. I did not research the bracket company and see if they gave permission. Okay. Maybe that's a question. I just asked you if you asked the question of Mr. Collard. I did not ask that question okay. of Mr. Collard. Commissioner Perini and then Vice Chair Cavillia. And Commissioner Rogers. Okay, that's working, <laughs> I think, now. I want to, you know, I, I read a lot of this stuff for a lot of time. And one of the things I feel very much for is the law enforcement people here have done an outstanding job, and I believe that. And I think some of the information they got from some of the people that we're involved with, I think some of them gave information to you. I think you fellowed with that, you saw some things. 
you believed in what actually you saw, what they were doing. I'm looking at that as really that in that particular enforcement, which has something been pretty good. I think one of the things they're looking at is under the public access, we know there's a camera, right? Don't have to worry about the other one. We also have to sit there and think about that is actually the, the bait, which is there. And that's exactly what it was with the blind. And I look at that and I look at all these other people who are talking the same things and all the things they're doing, they worked hard for what they did. And I don't see where it's a negative. I think it's a positive that they did something to do something right. And I'm hoping it keeps on going that way. And I mean that. And that's the way I really believe it should be. Thank you. Vice Chair Cavillia and then Commissioner Rogers. Uh, just Warden Anderson, you said you you known Mr. Collard. Uh, do you know how long Mr. Collard's held a guide license in Nevada? A lot longer than I've been here. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, needless to say, well, he's not new to guiding in Nevada. No, correct? he's been around for many years. Commissioner Rogers. Yeah, just one. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just one quick question for Warden Anderson, and that is. Um, along those same lines, you'd mentioned that you had uh, known Mr. Collard and um, mentioned you had uh, conversations with him during the uh, Garrett Johnson investigation. I was just curious if you had um, uh, other interaction or conversations with Mr. Collard prior to the Garrett Johnson case. Yes. And curious if that was just in passing or other I mean, you investigations? Can't, you can't be a guide. I mean, a game warden in Unit 231 or 22 and not deal with the guides that run that area. I mean, you're almost in weekly contact with them for various reasons. I'm asking you questions or um, running into them in the field and checking their guide paperwork. It's just, it's going to happen. So I wouldn't, over 50 interactions I would say probably within phone calls texts over the years all right thanks super cat okay we'll call uh, uh, captain Kramer to the stand Make sure you're close to that microphone. Can you hear me okay? How did you form an opinion as to the appropriate, what was an appropriate suspension for Mr. Collard based on the information you were aware of? What I do um, is part of my, my position as captain over the wildlife program. Um, I have to evaluate um, some, some things uh, such as uh, guide suspensions, revocations, and the, uh, and the, I do that very simply. It, it's based on uh, NRS 504-390, which gives the commission the authority in the first place to place uh, a suspension, revocation on a guide or any administrative permit um, up to five years. Then the commission gives the department, in my, in my case, it's my position, the authority in NAC 504-370, I'm sorry, 504-671 uh, to make those decisions and evaluations. So through the commission, um, I'm the person that then deems what is appropriate and what's not. Uh, what I do is I look at several of the circumstances that come with the case, and every case is different. I look at the totality of the specific case the facts, the circumstances, and any, any then aggravating circumstances that might come out uh, concerning that case and form uh, with, what's in an opinion on the, the time limit or the type of suspension that it would be. Some of those, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. What, 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 what did you, what kind of conduct uh, did Mr. Collard engage in that um, was the basis for your determination that a three-year suspension was appropriate? All right, well, thank you for the question. So in this particular case, uh, some basic things I look at in guide re uh, suspensions, revocations is one, and this question just came up as to what is the experience 
of, of Mr. Collard. And in this case, he's been a guide for the state of Nevada since 2005. Minus two years, um, that's a 15 year period that he's been a Nevada guide. So the expectation, in my opinion, is that he should understand any and all laws of the state of Nevada in, in relation to hunting. Um, the next is what's the violation type? Um, what is it that, you know, the, the severity of the conduct in the case? And yes, he was uh, criminally charged with the uh, one count of a trail camera violation. But when you look again at the totality of the circumstances related to the overall case, um, I find that you know, there is a, uh, not only the, the camera that was left out um, and, and then being actively used to check to see if there's uh, animals coming into this one location, but then a bait pile. And as Warden Anderson um, stated, this was the most elaborate bait pile or baiting scheme that he's ever seen. And after viewing the photographs and discussing that, I would agree it's, the, it's the, one of the worst I've ever seen as well. Not only that, but then we have additional circumstances to where the cameras were pointed at from, from the blind and then from a different location were pointed at the bait. So in my interpretation, the only purpose of the cameras in the first place was to determine the success of the baiting scheme that was taking place. So that's a serious aggravated circumstance. Um, the blind that they were hunting from was set within bow range and this was an archery tag. So again, the bait to the to the blind is with an archery range, archery range, excuse me. Um, and then the final one in, in this aggravated circumstances are the fact that the hunter was seen with Mr. Collar actually hunting at the location, which is not the case before with the Garrett Johnson case that you heard before, where he had a bait pile and cameras set up um, for I think it was six days after uh, the closure of the season, but that was more or less a scouting uh, type mission and not an actual hunting situation where we have proof and fact that this was taking place at this site. In addition to that, um, you know, I also look at the cooperation that we get from uh, the, the suspects during the investigation. Are they continuing to uh, mislead? Are they misleading at all? or they, they have come forth to uh, just basically spill what happened and take ownership of it. Um, in this case, we heard that Mr. Culler did intentionally mislead, and then uh, that was a brief, but that also happened during the Troy Robb appeal as well. He did the same thing. He misled, and then recanted, and then decided to tell the truth, and that's fine. Um, so I look at lots of different you know, a lot of different types of circumstances related to the facts and circumstances. And again, we can't say that Mr. Robbs was the same as, as this case. Well, the violation that was, um, that was charged and found convicted of might be the same, but the cases are completely different. The facts, the circumstances of the cases are completely different. So that's how I come up with the determ determination of how I set the suspension term. And again, we have up to five years. And I know that it was argued that a middle of the road, this wasn't a middle of the road, but I argue that it is. I have up to five years that I can suspend or revoke or deny. And this is a three year suspension. To remind the commission, how long was Mr. Robb suspended for? Mr. Robb was suspended and upheld by this commission for three years. And did he place bait? He did not place bait. Okay, so there was an additional element here of bait placement. Exactly, and that's, that's why I was describing as the, uh, one of the aggravating circumstances in, in my decision on this. No more questions. Yes, uh, Captain Creamer, how are you today? I'm doing well. Good. Um, you agree that in Warden Anderson's report, and this is Exhibit 7, he indicated that Russell Collard was very cooperative and forthcoming about the situation, correct? He, I believe he did state that. And nowhere in that report, either the draft report or the final report, did he ever indicate that, that uh, Mr. Collard uh, was intentionally misleading anyone 
back there. Mr. Anderson didn't. Uh, Mr. Giles' report um, does mention something to that effect. It didn't indicate that he uh, intentionally misled. True. Uh, I believe he did state that it was in, it was misled. And then he, he's also stated after that that he uh, was forthcoming and cooperative after. I'm paraphrasing. Sure. We want to be accurate just one moment. Mr. Clower, do you have another question maybe while you're looking? Um, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll move on with okay. that. I don't, I don't believe that he ever indicated that he intentionally misled. I think that the question was when he was asked uh, about the bait, he said, well, it's Bruce Jensen's, and then he said, no, it's mine, I'm taking responsibility. Is that a fair characterization of what took place? That, I believe, we're on the same page. That would be a... Uh, a lie followed by the truth. Either way. Understood. Okay. Um, with respect to uh, Garrett Johnson's event, uh, you agree that that was in out in the middle of nowhere and there was really no way to see whether or not he was hunting over that. What is your question? Garrett Johnson's event was out in the middle of nowhere. I would have to review that case, but I don't see the relevance as to location. Well, you, you've just indicated that uh, one of the reasons that you feel that this is, uh, I guess, worse off than Mr. Johnson's, even though both of them involve a camera and both of them involve bait, is that uh, Mr. Collard was seen with a, with a uh, customer hunting or a hunter hunting over the bait. Right? That is correct. Okay. And Mr. Collard's uh, location was out in the open where anybody could see, right? Well, they would be on private property to, to do so, I believe. Um, I believe if the commission looks at the report of Warden Giles, uh, the location that they were on was public property. Um, I don't want to cross examine. Captain Kramer, I'm trying to be very respectful to Madam Chair, but I'm trying to also establish the record. Um, now, with respect to the uh, the guide for 15-year period, uh, that's a factor that you've listed. You agree that uh, Mr. Rob was a guide, has been a guide in either Nevada or neighboring state of Utah since I believe 2012. Okay. You agree with that, right? Uh, I would have to go back and look at his record. I don't, I don't remember. Okay. Do you remember testifying at this commission uh, in January? I do. you remember offering testimony? I remember offering testimony, yes. Okay. I would just ask the commission to review that as uh, it was discussed, and it's also discussed in uh, uh, the transcript that I provided. So as I see this, just to, to ensure that the record is, is, is crystal clear, um, the aggravating factors when Mr. Um, Collards is compared to Mr. Johnson's, uh, you've indicated that the only differentiating factor that I heard was that Mr. Johnson was not seen actually hunting over the bait. Is that accurate? Well, there's a couple. Um, that is one. The fact that uh, Mr. Collard had a customer um, at the bait site um, hunting, actively hunting. Uh, the second one is um, Mr. Johnson had his trail camera out that we know of six days after the closure of the season and not 46 days. Um, and then, uh, of course, the, the difference, another big difference being um, Johnson had a, a mineral lick or some minerals on the ground versus an entire uh, the smorgasbord of, of elaborate baiting going on. Okay. 
And as far as the location of Johnson's site, you would agree that that was in a serotypus place, meaning it was, it was not visible from the road, it was not by a water source, it was not by uh, anything along those lines. Is that fair? Um, I'd have to, that wasn't my case. I didn't, I didn't, I don't know where that exactly took place. Well, if you're here to tell the commission, if you're here to tell the commission to give the commission a recommendation, mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm trying to reconcile now because you're giving the commission a recommendation as to what's a fair punishment, yet you're not able to talk about the facts of that case. I don't know the location. You're saying it was in the, in the middle of nowhere. I don't know exactly where that was, but I'm not going to disagree that it was in a remote area, okay. way more so than this. Okay, so it wasn't like right off the road like this situation? Um, I don't know, but I, I, uh, based on what I remember of the case, in, in your re recollection, um, I guess it would be probably not off the road. Okay, and then uh, just the last comparison, then I'll move on, Commissioner. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, with respect to the comparison of Mr. Collard's case and Mr. Robb's case, you would agree that uh, when Mr. Robb was confronted, um, he acknowledged that he knew that it was wrong from the very beginning? Yes. Whereas in this situation, Mr. Collard never indicated that he knew this was wrong. In fact, he was mistaken as to what the law allowed. Concerning the cameras, that's, that's what the testimony says, but not concerning the bait. As we sit here today, I've not seen any evidence anywhere in either the binders or the oral testimony to suggest that Mr. Collard knew that it was illegal to place bait on private property. Well, I, it, it's akin to this. If you go through stoplights if you speed you're still responsible for the outcome even though you may be um, utterly unaware of what the, the traffic laws are you're still responsible for it 15 years as a guide in the state he needs to be responsible for this information totally 100 percent agree totally 100 percent agree he needs to be responsible for this information mm -hmm. okay but there is a distinction between willfully and intentionally violating something. Okay? Willfully and intentionally violating something versus being mistaken as to what the law allows. You would agree with that, sir? Not entirely. However, I'll add this. Um, we also heard testimony today, and it's in a report as well, that uh, the year before, when, he, when Mr. Collard was in, uh, interviewed uh, by John Anderson, the, the, during the, I'm sorry, looks like my microphone stopped. <clears throat> Test. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Test. Test. Speak loud. All right, can you hear me? Oh, okay. All right, uh, I, I kind of forgot where I was exactly, but uh, the year before Mr. Collard uh, was uh, using bait on this, in this particular case, he was interviewed uh, concerning the Garrett Johnson case, of which, which John Anderson, Warden Anderson, uh, interviewed Mr. Collard. And he was at that time fully aware and then disappointed, in fact, that uh, Garrett Johnson was using bait and cameras at that time. So, yes, he was aware. Um, I don't, uh, which, in my opinion, this is one of my aggravating circumstances, lends itself to intentionally knowing that it is wrong, it is unlawful, and it was intentional to keep doing this. Okay. And looks like mine's well no mine's working so 
as far as um, using the bait in the Johnson situation, you agree that the Johnson situation has zero private element to that event, true? Yep, the, the bait law has no distinction between private and public land. It is simply unlawful. I, I understand that, but any discussion that Warden Anderson or Mr. Collard would have had was specifically with respect to public land, true? Based on Warden Anderson's testimony, he does not recall of what his conversation was, and I wasn't there to hear it. I'm sorry. Okay. And um, with respect to um, Mr. Collard in this situation, you would agree there was zero attempt. I mean, like Warden Anderson said, this was an elaborate baiting. There was zero attempt for him to hide any of that information, any of the bait, anything to make this some covert operation. True? Uh, again, it, it, that, that goes toward his intent and his personal knowledge of it, and I can't speak to his personal knowledge. I'm sorry. And, and that, was, that was, I guess, the point that I was trying to make, is that it does go to his intent. If he's out there in the middle of a field that everyone can see, that you can drive right up to, and it's this elaborate scene, the intent would be that he's not trying to hide anything. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. We have no more witnesses, uh, and we'll, so we'll close our case. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the commission if they have question, questions for Captain Kramer. Any questions for Captain Kramer, and then we'll come right back. No? Okay. All right. So you're finished with your side. Exactly. Okay. So that moves us on to um, C, rebuttal. Or do you have, do you have any, are you calling witnesses? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Mr. Clark? Okay. So we're moving on to C. The department and the appellant will present any rebuttal evidence and then be cross-examined cross by the other party and questioned by the commission on issues limited to the rebuttal evidence. Would we be clear? Okay. Uh, I think council was just clarifying they don't have rebuttal, we don't have rebuttal, we can go to closing argument. Correct. We're moving on. Yes. Okay. Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. So we're on closing our arguments. Yes. So again, um, I wanted to clarify a couple of things. Uh, Commissioner McNich, Commissioner Allenberg, uh, this is never a situation where Mr. Collard has tried to hide, okay? He was hunting over the bait. There's no question about that. Plain and simple, he was hunting over the bait. He's never tried to claim, oh, I was just out there, uh, you know, looking at cattle. His big mistake is not checking the regulation to verify that baiting is illegal on public and private. He was under the mistaken impression that he could bait as long as it was on private. And that was the conversation uh, with respect to um, Warden Giles and Warden Anderson was on the camera issue. Okay, it's the same thing. And logically, Logically, if you think about this, if you put yourself in his shoes, if the policy consideration behind these laws is the um, state resource, okay, if animals are a state resource, all right, the policy provision is, well, you can't bait on private because it's a state resource, and you can't bait on public because it's a state resource. Well, the policy consideration is identical with respect to cameras. You shouldn't be able to use a camera on public if it's a state resource after the time, and you shouldn't be able to use it on private after the time because it's a state resource. So the big mistake that, that Mr. Collard made was in his mind when he clarified about the camera issue, can I use the cameras on private, he was told yes. He made the logical assumption that he could also bait on private. And that was wrong. There's no question that was wrong. He made a mistake. But again, there's a big difference between making an honest mistake and making an intentional, um, you know, in, in the law, when you talk about intent, intent is a mental state of mind. It's called mens rea. You want to do something that you know 
is illegal. That's the difference between a criminal action versus a civil action. If I get out of my car, to use uh, Captain Creamer's example, if I get out of my car and I am going 90 miles an hour and I know, and I know that there's a stop sign ahead but I don't care and I'm going to blow through the stop sign no matter what and I hit and kill someone, that is a crime. I'm going to get charged for vehicular manslaughter or potentially even some level of murder. The difference is, is um, if you're going along and you think that you're within the law and you're not sure that there's a stop sign and you run the stop sign and you cause a car crash and somebody dies, you're not charged criminally. You're charged civilly. They can sue you uh, for wrongful death. So that is the big distinction here. With respect to Mr. Rob, um, his actions, he knew that it was wrong, yet he chose to do it anyway. With respect to, um, and you know, there's, there's one thing called circumstantial evidence in the law, right? Direct evidence is you see something. So I see the snow falling. Circumstantial evidence is I walk outside and there's snow on the ground. I can deduce that it snowed, right? Even though I didn't see it. Well, the circumstantial evidence in this case is that Russ Collard believed that he was within the law. I mean, my goodness, if, if he's going out there and having this quote-unquote elaborate bait site that anyone can see from anywhere, that is not evincing a state of mind that he knew that it was illegal and he is trying to hide it. It's, it's just, it's, it doesn't evince that state of mind. And so, uh, again, for the reasons that we've set forth, we think that the Rob case is easy, easily distinguishable. It's, it's way less, or I mean, excuse me, way more egregious because of that conscious state of mind. He knew he was doing wrong. He knew that he placed those cameras. And as a matter of fact, he tried to hide them. He put them up in an area that was so far away that he didn't think that he would get caught. Compare that with Mr. Collar. He's placing this out in the middle of, of the open. And then same thing with uh, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson placed the camera. It was in a hidden place. It wasn't easily accessible. A hunter just stumbled upon it. And so um, I certainly believe that, you know, equal treatment, um, there should be an, an equal application of the law, an equal application of the suspensions. And as I spent time going through all of the revocations in this case, or in this state, for the past 10 years, for 10 years, there's only been one other other than Mr. Rob, one other three-year suspension, and that was for essentially a poaching case where the individual was obstructing uh, an investigation. That's the only other three-year case. And so when you compare those things, when you compare the apples to apples, uh, I believe that it's, it's more than adequate for a one-year suspension. I believe that the commission can send a very, very strong, very strong message to Mr. Collard that this ever happens again. It's a five-year suspension. He's done. And I'll just note that um, Mr. Collard offered through the prosecuting attorney to be on probation for 10 years, for an entire decade, an entire decade, offered to pay double the maximum fines, offered to, to have 50 hours of community service. None of those things are called for in the statute, but that was rejected. It was rejected because the entire purpose of, of the state uh, prosecuting attorney and Captain Creamer was to suspend this man for a, a period of time. And it's his entire livelihood. It's what he does. It's not a part-time gig for him. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm making the record. I know I'm a pain in the butt. And, you know, and I apologize to the commission for that. I really sincerely do. But I would hope that each of you, if you were in my client's shoes, you would understand the importance of this and you would understand why I'm here doing what I'm doing. It's not to be disrespectful. It sincerely is not. It's to create a record. It's to create a record. This is how this man pays for his kids' food. It's how he pays for his mortgage. It's how he pays for all of these things. And it was not an intentional disregard. So with that, I... Uh, throw ourselves at the mercy of the commission.
and respectfully request a one-year suspension. Okay, thank you, Mr. Burkett. Thank you, um, Council. Want to you get closer to the mic, Mr. Burkett. I want to just offer to Council a very good argument. Um, thought that he did a great job with the argument on behalf of his client. I think the issue here is as it relates to this sort of knowledge versus lack of knowledge. When you have an individual who's been a guide for 15 years and you have a statute that's been in place for over a decade, a lack of knowledge is even more concerning. How could you not be aware for being a guide for 15 years and a statute that had been in place for over a decade, that that statute was in existence, first of all, and that secondly, what that statute said or what that regulation said. I want to read the regulation and I apologize, just bear with me, because the regulation is so abundantly clear. This is in, on page 71 of the, the Endow documents, it's almost the last page. NAC 503.149, baiting big game mammals. A person shall not, A, bait big game mammals for the pur purpose of hunting. It's that simple. There's no private or public. There's no indication of any separation. This, the regulation is very easily understandable. It's very easily understood. And as a guide, here's the problem that Mr. Collard has. I'm sure he's a fine gentleman. But here's the problem they have with this argument. He's supposed to know the regulations. He's a guide. He's not a hunter. And the difference between Mr. Collard's conduct and many of the others that are involved in um, counsel's graph is a lot of these are hunters or their suspend their denials for somebody who applied for a license and didn't do whatever they're supposed to do. There's only one direct comparative in circumstance, and that's the Troy Rob one, in which you just issued a three year suspension. On top of the Troy Rob one, what you have here is according to Mr. Anderson, the most elaborate bait scheme that he's ever seen. The same for Mr. Kramer, to the point that Mr. Giles is concerned that wildlife that's consuming all of this volume of materials is going to get sick. We also have the fact that they purposely take that bait, use it to then shoot a big game animal. They put a blind in, in front of it, they put a camera in front of that blind, and they point that camera at the bait this most elaborate bait scheme you've ever seen. If Mr. Collar doesn't know that you can't bait on private property, he should know it's illegal to feed wildlife. And what conclusion could you draw based on the circumstances of this case other than he was illegally feeding wildlife? If he wasn't, violating NAC 503.149. But I think the most crucial and unfortunate circumstance here is the impression that he gives the public by doing this. Because what he does is he brings a person in, a client in, and he uses that client, or he places this client in this blind over bait, the most elaborate bait scheme you have ever seen, and then he uses that to help this client secure the harvesting of a big game animal. What conclusions can we draw about that conduct? That it's cheating. He's clearly cheating. And if he doesn't know that, I mean that's our argument, that he doesn't know that he's cheating, how could you not know? How could you not know that this kind of conduct is cheating? with all due deference to the argument. You have to know this was cheating. In addition, you have this situation where you have an individual who's left a camera up on public for over 45 days past when it should have been removed. Frankly, I don't think that's as egregious. 
I mean, that is problematic. You shouldn't have done it. But it's the fact that you put a client in a blind with a camera that you're using to monitor the, the situation to make sure that you're having success for your client. And we heard testimony that they use that monitoring equipment. They downloaded the equipment to see what game was attracted. Clearly, they're using that to help them harvest an animal, which is cheating. And I think it's egregious from the standpoint that he's doing it clearly with this elaborate bait scheme, clearly with a client intended to harvest a big game animal. And you have another individual member of the public that is, has none of those advantages. Let's put it that way. Somebody who doesn't have a guide has none of those advantages. It's cheating. You're, you're seeking an advantage that somebody else doesn't have. And guides should know better. Guides should know what the law is. Thank you. Just a final closing? I Madam think Chair. that was closing. I, I don't know. What, what's your process say? I can't remember. Closing arguments will be presented by the appellant and then by the department. The commission will deliberate. Yeah, and then render orally its order with separately uh, stated findings of fact and conclusions of law. So we bring it back to the commission now. I, I think because the because it's my burden, I get a rebuttal closing. No, you, we, we passed rebuttal. I asked you if you had rebuttal and you said no. That's rebuttal evidence. No. We're clearly I, that's why I asked to see if there was a rebuttal uh, uh, closing. I, I don't see. It doesn't sound like there is. Okay, so I'm bringing it back to the commission for deliberation. Does anyone have any thoughts that they'd like to share? No? Commissioner Rogers, you want to go first? <laughs> okay. I don't think. Hello. Oh, mine does work. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to a uh, couple of comments and, and, and thoughts around all of this today. Um, you know, we were given all of this material uh, a number of days ago, and I really took it upon myself. I think I certainly owed it to this commission, to the state, um, uh, to Mr. Collard as well, to really read through all of that material. And I did over the course of several nights. Um, to really understand uh, the evidence, everything that was um, talked about in the various reports, and listened intently today. I know there's a lot of material covered today, but listened very intently um, on everything that was shared. And, you know, my two cents, I guess, on the matter is I'd like to commend uh, Captain Kramer. And, uh, and Wardens Anderson and, and Giles for their investigation. I think they did a complete and thorough job uh, throughout the process. Uh, I said this in, in the, the previous case of Troy Robb, and I'm going to say it again today. I think that having a guide license in the state of Nevada is a privilege, and it's not a right. Mr. Collard is a non-resident of the state of Nevada and I think has a, an even higher obligation to uphold standards and has an obligation to know the laws, to know the rules, to know the regulations. And especially, again, given his, his tenure as a licensed guide. I think the suspension, in my opinion, of three years um, is appropriate. Uh, I certainly would support nothing less than that may even consider supporting more. Um, also, it didn't affect any of his personal hunting, only his, uh, only his guide uh, license at suspension. So again, just my two cents, I would support that uh, three years. I think that a um, uh, gentleman mentioned uh, offering a one year with a very stern warning. Uh, my two cents, again, I would offer and support a three-year, if not more, with also a very stern warning to Mr. Collard and any sub-guides um, that uh, are doing business illegally 
in the state of Nevada that there are absolutely consequences for their actions and they need to know the laws. Thank you, Commissioner Rogers. Anybody else have? Uh, Commissioner Weiss. Um, I agree um, wholeheartedly uh, with everything you just said. Um, we talked last at the last case about how ignorance of the law wasn't an excuse, and we talked about how the guidelines were meant to have teeth so that we would stop these types of behaviors. Um, I appreciate everything that was put forth today. Um, I think that there, with the questions surrounding the blind and the camera and the property, um, all of that should be taken into account. But even when we look at these and the property boundaries, it seems pretty clear to me that the westernmost camera was absolutely on public land. And even if we're not talking about the camera, that baiting and hunting a baited area were all done. Um, and should the knowledge that baiting an area uh, was illegal should have been known by somebody who has been guiding for that long. So I would also support maintaining the sentence or even um, something higher. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Weiss. Anyone else have thoughts? Yet? No? Vice Chair Cavilia. I'm kind of on the same page. I, mean, I, I have a gun license as well. I'm playing the same boat, but I, guides are held to a higher standard, which is good for ideas. With all the mapping software that we have nowadays, in my opinion, There's, there isn't an excuse um, to have an issue like this. And then, to be, to be frank, um, the outfit that Mr. Collard guides for, they have the biggest spotlight on them in Nevada. They just do. That's everybody knows it, you know. And so, I mean, with that, with that spotlight on you, I mean, in my in my mind, you'd have thought you'd have even been more cognizant to everything you were doing. You know, if that makes sense, um, as far as knowing the laws and paying attention to property boundaries and whatnot, because they do, they they have the biggest spotlight on them in the state. There's no doubt. Um, so, I I'm kind of on the same lines as, as everyone else up here. I I don't. The three years to me seems it seems reasonable. Yeah, I don't I don't see anything less than that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll make it quick. I uh, appreciate the comments from the commissioners that have already spoken, and I do agree with them at this point. Okay. Anybody else? Um, for me, I, I've got lots of thoughts running through my head, but for me, the um, egregiousness of this, the, the baiting is just unacceptable to me. And we do hold guides to a higher standard. We have to. Um, people rely on them to, to follow the law. We rely on them to follow the law. I think, you know, you kept comparing this case to others and the case with Mr. Robb, we actually got to talk to Mr. Robb. We've not heard a peep out of this, this gentleman. And I, and I think, unfortunately, that, that was a hindrance. He, he could have come up and talked to us and told us he was sorry and all the things that Mr. Robb tried to, to explain to us, but we haven't heard anything from him today. And that, to me, is, is kind of unacceptable. Um, I get it that he hired you to be his, his spokesperson, but um, I just would have liked to have heard from him. Um, so I, I'm, at, I'm at a minimum of three years and quite possibly five, depending on where everybody else sits on this. And that's just where I come. I, I too, have looked through all this material, and um, it's... It's a lot for us that we don't do these every day, but we do have to, to uh, sorry, we do have to uphold the law. Commissioner Almberg. Yeah, I guess for me, um, I had asked in the previous case about if there was a hunter with him. Uh, and the reason I asked that is because they, they subject that hunter. If that hunter does something they know is wrong, that hunter is now in trouble and it, it's their duty to keep them out of trouble uh, and safe there's all kinds of uh, obligations when it comes to having that hunter with you and so for me that that that's very important that it validates why he, the need to know 
So uh, that that's an extenuating circumstance for me, uh, for sure. Uh, and you know, I, I, I the, it, the communication world, you know, the hunting world, and and people when you put yourself out there, it, it they're. Uh, it, it's it's such a small world of communications there. It's hard for me to believe that everybody doesn't know because we there it's talked about and talked about, especially in the this, the community here. Um, it, I I'm okay with not going to five years. I'm not going to be anything less than three years because I think that the message is going to be out there that look, it's it's significant and. You know, I, I don't want to go to the next step of having to ratchet up. I hope that the communication is so good, everybody's following this, that three years they're saying, hey, look, this was put in place by the sportsman. The sportsman was a part of this case, and the sportsman uh, wanted it, this regulation. It was, there was lots of discussion for it. And the sooner, I mean, it's been very good compliance. The sooner it's total compliance and everybody's on the it's it, it, the better, you know, so we don't have to ratchet up. I don't want to ratchet it up. I just want people to comply. Okay. Anybody else? Do I have a motion? I don't have a motion. I'll make a motion that uh, we suspend Mr. Collard's guide license for three years based on the findings that he placed a trail camera on public land past the season date and that he illegally baited uh, wildlife against the NAC, NRS, whatever it is. Let me look. The NAC, 503.145 and 503.149. Do I have a second? Do I have a second by Commissioner Perini. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Eight to zero with Commissioner Barnes absent. So please enter the decision into the record. Uh, let's see, I think we're moving on. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair, thank you. Commissioners, thank you. I know it's been a long day. I sincerely appreciate uh, all of your attention. Uh, I know it has been a long day, so thank you. Okay. We are moving on to agenda item nine, Nevada Department of Wildlife Project updates, um, Secretary Wasley informational. The commission has requested that the department provide regular project updates for ongoing projects and programs as appropriate. Based on geography and timing of meetings, these updates are intended to provide additional detail in addition to the summaries provided as part of the regular department activity re report and are intended to educate the commission and public as to the department's ongoing duties and responsibilities. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we had intended to have three parts to this department uh, project update agenda item today. Uh, was, would include an update on Recovering America's Wildlife Act, federal legislation would also uh, include an update on the state's uh, wildlife action plan and that uh, development and review process. And then thirdly, um, provide some information regarding the field trip that will commence uh, upon our adjournment today. In the interest of time, uh, we will um, postpone the discussion on the state wildlife action plan but I will give an extremely brief update on as to the status of Recovering America's Wildlife Act and then we'll uh, promptly segue to a presentation from uh, the Southern Region Fisheries Supervisor Brandon Sanger who will give us a little bit of background and history as to uh, what, what we're going to see on our field trip. So um, Quickly, uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, it was uh, six years ago, earlier this month, that the Blue Ribbon Panel that was co-chaired uh, by Johnny Morris of Bass Pro Shops and, and Cabela's and former Wyoming Governor Dave Friedenthal uh, made the recommendations of that Blue Ribbon Panel 
uh, publicly known in an announcement at the National Press Club. And the two recommendations were specifically to dedicated sustainable funding for conservation, number one, and, and number two, uh, to address uh, the relevancy of conservation in, in society. So fast forward uh, six years later, there have been multiple versions of Recovering America's Wildlife Act passed or, or uh, introduced over the past couple Congresses. Each time um, the legislation has made it further and further through that process, we're presently at a point where um, a bill has been introduced uh, in, in the House Natural Resources Committee voted out of that committee uh, by overwhelming majority. Uh, there is a bill in the Senate that has, um, at this point, I believe 33 co-sponsors, 16 Democrats, 16 Republicans, and one Independent. Um, that number, it, it goes up almost daily. Uh, and it will be scheduled for markup in the Senate Environment Public Works Committee uh, presumably in the next uh, couple weeks. There are very few minor details that um, remain to be uh, resolved and we're, we're very optimistic, very, very hopeful at this bill's passage. What it would mean for the Nevada Department of Wildlife would be a dedicated uh, sustained funding, federal funding at a level of $24 million a year. Um, to implement the state's wildlife action plan. The current state wildlife action plan contains 256 of our 895 species and 22 types. Um, that, that plan is currently under revision and you will hear more about that at the next commission meeting. So I'll see if there's any questions on the status of Recovering America's Wildlife Act, that the bill, the, the process in, in Congress, or what it would mean to the department, um, and then we'll segue to Mr. Sanger on a presentation regarding the hatchery. Okay. Anybody have questions? Commissioner McNinch? You knew I would. Um, <laughs> so just a couple of, just a couple of quick comments. Um, most exciting time in wildlife in 80 years. Um, from a funding standpoint and uh, there's two phases of it and it has to do with the relevancy of conservation and the, the funding aspect and it's it's a two-pronged approach and and uh, the money's the easy part <laughs> okay the money's the easy part and it's going to take us to be part of that relevancy part too which means that we all have to come to some way of um, finding a way through this stuff and changing our perspectives and broadening our perspectives and and things like that. I'm challenged with it, um, just like anybody else. So I'm not pointing fingers or anything, but I want to just highlight uh, Tony and, and uh, I know Endow staff have been deeply, deeply, deeply involved at very high levels with a lot of this. I really appreciate the work and effort you guys are putting into it, uh, making this happen. Uh, we're all going to wish that we had an opportunity. Um, well, we're going to wish that we um, had um, more of a hand in it. It's, this is a this is a once in a many many generation opportunity, and it doesn't come around. And we're sitting up here getting to to be a part of that. So, if there's anything we can do as individuals or a commission, Tony, please let us know. I appreciate that very much, Commissioner McNinch. And I will say that this this the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners was the first commission in the nation to pass a resolution in support of this res, of this legislation under then Chairman Jeremy Drew. So I, I appreciate that. And and I just want to say that uh, to to Commissioner McNinch's point, um, this is possibly you know one of the the most significant points in terms of conservation funding and it isn't independent or or different or unique from Pittman Robertson which was passed in 1937 it's it's part and parcel to that it's building on that model um, last week uh, Colin O'Mara the the president of the National Wildlife Federation gave a, a beautiful uh, history of conservation funding and coming out of, of World War II and, and what Congress did and how they passed Pittman-Robertson and how sportsmen and women voted to tax themselves at, at that time and then the companion Dingle Johnson on the fisheries side of things with excise tax and how this is really the third leg of that funding stool and, and how they, they are um, so important to the work that we do and, and so I, I appreciate 
uh, past actions as commission and that offer of support, Commissioner McNinch. And if there is anything um, that this the board can do, I'll certainly reach out. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, other questions, comments? Okay. So we'll segue to Brandon Sanger, the Southern Region Fisheries Supervisor, to, to kind of give us a, a little overview of, of what we're going to see uh, and some of the, the Southern Region uh, fisheries efforts in conjunction with the Lake Mead Fish Hatchery. <laughs> so while you're setting up, do you mind if I ask, uh, maybe, maybe you want to deny it, but is this like a legacy type of thing, Mr. Sanger? Oh, it's a different spelling. So, different? Yeah, yeah. There you go. I just needed to ask. Yeah. He's chuckling. I don't know if he knows why, if you've been around for a while, but <laughs> it's been asked before. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Brandon Singer, Southern Region Fisheries Supervisor, Department of Wildlife, Southern Region. So our field trip this afternoon is going to be at our uh, our visitor center for our Lake Mead Hatchery, and this will actually be the first time um, that the public has had the opportunity to enter and see our visitor center. Um, and so, in preparation for that, I thought we'd give an uh, have an opportunity to give a background on the hatchery itself and kind of what it took to get to where we're at today and. Um, what it's going to look like moving forward. For those unfamiliar with the hatchery or the southern region, uh, as the name implies, it's adjacent to Lake Mead and located within the Lake Mead NRA. Um, it's halfway between the Henderson entrance to the park and the Boulder City entrance to the park. This is an overview of the facility itself. Um, starting on the left there, that round circle and then that rectangular building to the right, that's not part of the uh, hatchery, that's actually our water supplier that pumps water from Lake Mead um, to the facility. Uh, that parking lot to the right of that white rectangular building is our parking lot and kind of where the hatchery grounds start. Uh, that for, we have three buildings, that first building is our visitor center, hatchery offices, um, we have three different rearing rooms in that building. Uh, we have numerous storage, mechanical room, we have a wet lab. Uh, that building, that middle building is a, a series of concrete raceways or 80 foot raceways. We have about 24 of those in there. Uh, that brown structure to the right of that is an outdoor, um, it's actually a canopy, it's not a building. Those are outdoor raceways and again, those are 80 foot concrete structures. Um, and so in 1971, Endow and the Park Service uh, developed an MOU to outline um, management responsibilities of wildlife and resources within the park. That MOU was later revised to include uh, 17 acres to be provided to the Department of Wildlife to construct and operate the Lake Mead Fish Hatchery. Uh, construction of the original hatchery started in 1972 and its intent was to operate as a uh, sound mounted production facility. Um, and so like most of our fish hatcheries in the state of Nevada, um, rainbow trout has been our long, long focus and primary species at the Lake Mead Hatchery. But we did do a few, a few different species in the early days. Um, one example is Lahunt and cutthroat trout. Uh, we actually reared those fish in the 70s and we have a remnant population of one of those original stockings uh, on the west side of the Spring Mountains at Carpenter Canyon Creek. Um, and so it was a regional hatchery, it was designed to uh, provide trout across all four counties in the southern region, which is Clark, Lincoln, Nye, and Esmeralda counties. 
We typically stocked 21 waters and produced about 450,000 fish a year. So in the early 2000s, we had an opportunity to renovate the hatchery. At that point, it's about 30 years old. Um, and it was a, a ground up, full scale renovation with the intent of improving and modernizing uh, existing infrastructure and you know trying to get us out of the 70s and into the 2000s. And so we got all new water lines, rearing tanks, raceways, um, new offices, more modern oxygen delivery to the hatchery, uh, updated sensors, control systems. Um, we actually included part of the, part of that renovation was the creation of a visitor center. And one thing the the old hatchery didn't have was a native fish rearing room. And during the renovation, they built a dedicated room for native fish rearing. So 2002 was the last year of normal trout production and stocking of the original facility. Um, in 2003, we began decreasing our staff and making final preparations for the demo and construction. Um, in 2004 is when they shut water off to the hatchery. We began demolition and started construction um, activities at the hatchery. In 2005, restoration or renovation uh, remained ongoing. Um, kind of staged in the manner that we could start rearing fish at small scale uh, while construction was going on. So we actually received our first batch of eggs at the new renovated facility in July of 2005. In 2006, we continued construction around the site. Um, we began uh, increasing the amount of fish that we were rearing. Um, and then in 2007 is when construction was finally completed. Uh, the visitor center was the last thing to be completed, but it's part of the renovation. Uh, but in 2007, we had two big, two big problems came together uh, and unfortunately caused us to, to stop trout production. And so in, <clears throat> we started seeing decreasing lake elevations. At, at the hatchery, our intake is at a fixed, uh, fixed depth in the lake. And so as the lake goes down, we start bringing in warmer water. And so in 1990, before 1998, uh, you know, we had two decades of pretty consistent water level at the, ha at the Lake Mead. We had natural fluctuation that you'd see in most reservoirs. Um, and then after 98, we started seeing decreases in lake levels. Um, it turns out that was the start of the current two decade plus drought that we're currently in. Uh, so in 1998, the elevation was 1,214 feet. Um, by 2007, when we had to stop trout production, it had de decreased almost 100 feet. And so that, that caused, us to situ caused us to be in a situation where uh, we're bringing in water that was just too warm. Trout have a pretty narrow temperature range uh, that, they, that they need to survive in. They prefer 55 degrees, and once you start getting to the 60s, um, it becomes problematic. And so we got in a situation where the lake was going down so much that we were, had two, more, two warmer water temperatures. The second issue that we had um, was the discovery of quagga mussels in Lake Mead. They were discovered in January of 2007. Uh, once those are found in the lake, we began searching our, our lines of the hatchery because we draw raw lake water, it's not treated at all, and we discovered that we had quagga mussels in our pipes at the hatchery. And so the, <clears throat> excuse me, and so the, you know, the, the decrease in lake elevations and our fixed intake, there's a solution for that, and that's creating a deeper intake um, to bring in cooler water. It's not a quick fix. Uh, it's not a cheap fix, but there's a solution to that. Problem with quagga mussels, there isn't a ready solution to the quagga mussel issue. Um, they cause two main problems in a hatchery environment. One is operational problems. Uh, they foul valves, they foul screens, they attach to pretty much any core substrate. Um, and so it's a, a daily effort of scraping things off, replacing valves that get fouled. Um, it, it creates a lot of manpower issues and expense issues. The second problem is we can't stock fish out across the four counties that the hatchery was intended to. We don't want to be able to stock fish back into a quagga positive water, which is Lake Mead. And so if we were to use the hatchery uh, as normal, we'd be spreading invasive quag mussels all around the southern part of the state. And so while, <clears throat> after we shut down our trout production, um, we continued to operate our small efforts of rearing Razorback Sucker in our native fish room. Uh, Razorback Sucker is a warm water species, and so they weren't affected by the decreased 
lake levels um, and populations are found in Lake Mead and Lake Mojave and the Colorado River. So releasing those fish back out into the wild wasn't, wasn't an issue with quagga mussels. Well, we had to determine a path forward. We had this newly renovated facility. Um, it's largely being unused and it's just gonna sit uh, and collect cobwebs essentially. And so what, you know, what are we gonna do for it? How can we get it to continue to benefit wild, wildlife and specifically what, what fish use can we get out of it? We had water available for us for the hatchery, um, but it's too warm for trout. It's quagga mussel positive. Um, so anything that we reared, would have to be a warm water species. It could only be stocked uh, in a water that already has quagga mussels, which is just Colorado River. And we also need another funding source outside of our standard um, trout funds that we would operate the facility under. So we got thinking about our small efforts that we were doing in the native fish room. And it turns out native fish rearing checks all the boxes of what, you know, what, what our needs are and what we could do with the hatchery in its current state. Um, Razorback sucker and bony tail are both warm water species. They're native to the Colorado River. Uh, there's populations in the Colorado River and so we'd be stocking fish in water that's already quagga positive. Um, the work that we were doing with Razorback sucker and bony tail in the native fish room uh, was funded by the Bureau of Reclamation's MSCP so we already had an existing partnership with them. Um, and most importantly it allowed the facility to continue to do good things for Nevada's wildlife. So that's the direction we, we went. We, uh, we started rearing and expanding our efforts um, for native fish conservation. Um, and so we've been doing these cooperative agreements with the Bureau of Reclamation's multi-species conservation program since, it's since 2005. And the MSCP, uh, they're a 50 year program. Um, they were initiated in 2005 as well. Uh, and basically they're, they're tasked with implementing conservation measures along the lower Colorado River uh, to mitigate the effects that, their, that the Bureau's dams have had on native wildlife and their habitat. And so in terms of fish, one of their, big, their, their biggest conservation measure um, is native fish augmentation or stocking. And the Bureau, they don't own or operate uh, fish hatcheries, but they do have a number of state and federal partners that have fish hatcheries. And so what they do is they enter cooperative agreements with partnering agencies and provide them funding uh, to produce native fish, specifically razorback sucker and bony tail. And so when we started out with them in the native fish room in 2005, our original cooperative agreement didn't have any stocking goals. Um, we were basically rearing fish for experimental purposes, extra needs by researchers. Um, but we've, we've since expanded our, the scope of that agreement uh, in terms of number of fish and funding as well. And so our most current stocking obligations or stocking goals our 6,500 Razorback Sucker at 305 millimeters, which is 12 inches, uh, 7,000 Bony Tail at 12 inches. And the one thing unique about the Lake Mead Hatchery compared to other Razorback Sucker hatcheries is we have a lot of space. Um, our warmer water has allowed us to get fast growth and we've been able to produce some really large fish. And so we have a stocking goal of 2,000 Razorback Suckers at 450 millimeters, uh, which is about a foot and a half long. And so in the future, long term wise, we think we're going to be able to max out um, our annual production at 20,000 Razorback Sucker and 6,000 Bony Tail. In addition to that, we've, it's created jobs for Endow. We started that program in 2005. Um, we created one position using the Bureau of Reclamation funding. Uh, and since then, since we've expanded, we now have three positions that we've created and are funded through the, the MSCP cooperative agreement. So the rearing process for native fish is in some ways it's similar to, uh, to your standard trout operation, in some ways it's different. Um, one of the biggest differences with Razorback Sucker is that we collect uh, wild, wild larvae from Lake Mojave. And so the natural population in Lake Mojave, they spawn um, at known spawning grounds throughout Lake Mojave and then we go down and collect larvae that are a few days old uh, post hatch and then we take those to the facility and rear them up to a larger size before release. Um, this past year we got a batch of fish in from a federal fish hatchery that operates more in a um, standard broodstock format. They have they maintain a broodstock of Razorback Sucker at their facility. They manually uh, spawn their gammies and then they manually fertilize those eggs and then they hatch those eggs in captivity and then raise those up um, to stocking size or to ship elsewhere to other hatcheries. 
the bony tail we get those through that that same hatchery um, and it's that brood stock process as well except we don't get them at the larval stage we receive bony tail when they're typically about two to four inches long uh, the larval raceback sucker um, you know they're we're talking about fish that are 10 millimeters long and so they're they're too small to eat any type of pellet feed and they respond more to to live animals and so we hatch our own brine shrimp uh, we feed the larval larval fish brine shrimp until they're big enough to start transferring over into a, a ground up formulated pellet um, every raceback sucker and bony tail that we that we produce at the hatchery gets pit tagged before we release them into the Colorado River. Uh, and a pit tag is essentially like a microchip. And so it's I, every time we catch a razorback and, or a bony tail in the wild, we can identify which hatchery that fish was raised at. Um, we can determine its growth and we can track survival of the population over long term. And so the, the hatchery is, you know, is very valuable to the agency and to the state as a trout facility. Um, it's now very valuable to us as a native fish facility. Uh, but it's, it provides a lot more value other than just fisheries work as well. It's become a very important uh, facility and a resource to all of our divisions in the southern region. Our AIS um, Southern Region is head. Our AI, AIS Southern Region crew is headquartered at, at the Lake Mead Fish Hatchery. Um, we do a lot of training at the hatchery. The, our game warrants have used it a number of times. Uh, we've done CPR and first aid training at the hatchery, AIS training, um, all sorts of training from different divisions. Uh, storage, our, our agency is heavy on, on equipment. Our fleet of uh, game warren boats get stored out at the hatchery. Our fleet of fisheries boats get stored there. Um, our game, Habitat, and Con Ed, they all have a number of trailers and heavy equipment, and we provide storage uh, spaces for that as well. Um, bat detection, our diversity division has um, done bat detectors and bat surveys at the hatchery. Our game division has uh, repeatedly used the parking lot as a, a roundup and a, a holdover for transport of uh, tagged bighorn sheep. Um, they've even used the hatchery and the wet lab for uh, necropsies. Um, we've hosted a number of researchers on AAS species, specifically quagga mussels. Um, obviously, our fisheries division has used it for a number of research opportunities and projects, um, including doing surgeries on striped bass and black bass and holding those fish in, uh, at the hatchery while their surgery seal before we release them and track them in the wild. Um, we've experimented with novel rearing and spawning of various uh, native, species, native fish species. Um, native fish salvage, we've had a number of projects we've had to restore uh, habitats or eradicate non-native fish, and so we've salvaged populations of some of our native endangered fish, brought them out to the hatchery, and we've held them for um, extended periods of time while we restore that habitat, and then we release those fish back into those restored habitats. Um, our relic leopard frog head, start, head starting program, we partner with UNLV for that. Um, that's, we call it a head starting program for amphibians, but it's essentially a, a hatchery production type uh, process. We raise up eggs and release frogs out into the wild. Um, that's been very successful as well, and it's one of the main reasons we've been able to keep that species uh, off the Endangered Species Act. So it uh, takes us to the visitor center, and so we've, you know, we when we originally did the renovation, we um, built the, the visitor center, and we were hopeful and wanted to, you know, get public to see some of the important work that we do, um, experience what goes on at a hatchery, uh, but unfortunately, with the timing of our shutdown or our, our stopping of trout production in 2007, uh, we can never, never open up the visitor center. And so all of our information and messaging for the most part was, you know, was heavily focused on trout production. Um, now the facility has a new focus and so we have a new story to tell. Um, and so we want to be able to highlight the history of the Lower Colorado River, um, the history of the Lake Mead Hatchery itself, um, and tell the story of how it's being used to benefit Nevada's wildlife. So to get, get the visitor center open, we had two, two uh, obstacles that we had to overcome. Was one, we need to remodel. The inside, um, you know, was built back in the mid and early 2000s. So some of that stuff is outdated. Again, we have a new focus, a new story to tell. Um, and so it, we did want to do a full remodel on the inside. Uh, and then the quagga mussel issue, not only was it problematic for stocking fish throughout the state, but it's also problematic for a fire suppression system. 
So originally, our fire suppression system to the visitor center in the hatchery uh, was connected to our raw lake water line. Um, the advantage of that was we, at the time, we thought we'd have endless amounts of water available. Uh, our facility and our pipeline is capable of supporting eight to nine million gallons of water a day. Um, so at, when we constructed it, it was a good source. But now with quagga mussels, uh, it's becoming a major issue and we can never open the visitor center while we had a, a source of fire water that was quagga positive. And so we had to figure out a way to develop, um, you know, create a clean water line or clean water source in a most of cost effective way that we could do that was to construct this 200,000 gallon storage tank and it's uh, filled with potable potable water um, and we have a pump house that would pump water from the storage tank uh, into our fire suppression lines inside the building. Um, we still had the problem of quagga mussels in the lines and so uh, we partnered up with our AIS staff and their decontamination units that they use to pressurize, pressure wash boats um, and we charged all of the lines throughout the visitor center and throughout the hatchery uh, with hot water. Quagga mussels can't survive uh, past a certain temperature um, after exposure for an hour. And so we charged the entire, entire fire suppression system um, up to, I believe it was over 140 degrees and maintained that for over an hour in those lines. Um, and after that point, all the quagga mussels would be dead. And then we uh, did an extensive flushing through our, all of our fire lines um, and we also had installed new sprinkler heads, obviously, because of the risk of them being clogged with quagga mussels. And so now we got to a point where we have a, uh, a safe operating fire suppression system um, that's free of quagga mussels. And so that will allow us to be able to take the public into the visitor center. And so this is what the visitor center partly looked like when, when it was open. There's three main rooms to it. Um, on the left is our kind of our lobby or foyer when you walk in. Uh, that middle room is what we call, that middle picture is what we call our exhibit hall. Um, it's obviously where all of our information panels are. Um, we have a few different types of exhibits in there. And then the photo on the right is, uh, we at the time we constructed a, a meeting room. Um, obviously it's pretty bland, not much else to say other than it's a meeting room with some media capability. And so we did, I'm not going to, we did a full remodel on the place. Um, and we did this largely in house with Endow staff. Um, and that includes outside the visitor center and all three rooms inside. Um, I wish I would have put a photo on here of what the outside looked like before, but we had this real tall gate that went across a chain link fence, fence that's about eight feet high with barbed wire. Uh, looked more like a prison system than it did a inviting fish hatchery. And so we, we did a bunch of fence work out there, um, install, installed new wooden fencing. Um, and it was, a, it was an agency or a division-wide effort. Um, all the divisions pitched in, whether it's Habitat game, um, our engineering staff did an awful lot of work on the outside and the inside to get this place renovated and uh, up the snuff. And our, our conservation education division, they really took the lead on um, a lot of the design and certainly a lot of our informational panels with that and uh, sourcing, you know, information and translating all of our, you know, biologist talk into something meaningful for the public to read. And I didn't, I didn't provide a whole lot of uh, photos here, what it looks like now, because we're hopeful that folks are going to be able to come out today and see it. And if not, you know, certainly going to be opportunities for people in, in the future to see it. And so while all this was going on, you know, we were rearing fish in our native fish room, um, you know, at the hatchery, we're working on renovating the fire suppression system, uh, working on renovating the visitor center. The lake level decline didn't stop. Uh, 2007 was a, a record low water year at 1,117 feet. Since that 2007 record low, we've set new seven new records for low water years. Um, and 2021 was our most recent record for a low water year at 1,073 feet. Uh, and if you'll recall in 1998, uh, between 1998 and 2007, uh, the lake had dropped about 100 feet, and from 2007 to where we are today, it's dropped 54 feet. Uh, so we're looking at a drop of well over 150 feet. 
And so before the, that drought uh, became on setting there around 2000 or after 98, you know, we were we had water cold enough to, to raise trout in. So that means our water is around 55, 60 degrees. And in, in our recent years here, our, our summer water temperatures at the hatchery has been in the mid 80s. And so with the, you know, these big declines that we see in the water levels, it's became a bigger problem than just warm temperatures. Uh, Razorback sucker and bony tail, they're a warm water fish, but they still need water. Our hatchery intake roughly sits at about 1,050 feet uh, and the lake. And the Bureau of Reclamation, they put out 24 month lake projections uh, throughout the year, they update it monthly. And last year we started seeing some uh, very concerning and drastic uh, lake level drops, you know, a year or so out. Um, so at the time, at the end of summer 2021, uh, those projections were forecasting for lake elevations to drop down to 1051 uh, this coming August and September. So obviously that's right around what our level of our hatchery intake is. Um, and so we're staring down a real chance of not being able to pump water into the hatchery due to the lake dropping so low. Uh, the best case scenario we're looking at is we'd be sucking in water, um, surface water that's a few feet deep, that's gonna be extremely warm and of poor quality. So we had a decision to make, um, a big one at the time, the late summer and early fall when those, those drastic projections were starting to come out and it looked like it was gonna become an actual reality. Uh, we had about 6,500 bony tail on station and over 35,000 Razorback sucker. And so we had to figure out what we were going to do. Um, you know, we could gamble and hope that those projections aren't borne out and that we have improved lake level conditions. Um, we could wait and rear fish as long as we possibly could. Uh, and then if those lake levels do hit, you know, then we could handle emergency when that comes. Um, and so we were trying to think about what, you know, what's some other information that would inform our decision here outside of, you know, what's the right thing, you know, the good thing to do. Um, and in general, especially with warm water fish and raised back suckers in particular, it's always better and safer to handle these fish and transport them during the cooler months. Uh, in the cooler months, we have colder water. The colder water has better dissolved oxygen. Um, it's much less stressful on the fish. Uh, you get very limited to no mortality when you transport and handle fish during those cooler months. Uh, going into the spring, um, we've thought about that. Uh, unfortunately, that's a very busy time for not just Endow, but our partners at the Bureau um, that we'd rely on to be able to you know, process all these fish and then stock them all out. Um, so if we did that in the spring, we kind of had to turn all both of our agencies' worlds upside down to make that happen. Um, or if we can't got an emergency situation, you know, that affect a lot of other ongoing work. Uh, the worst case scenario for sorting, handling, and stocking fish out is in the warmer spring uh, and summer months, your water temperature gets real warm. Uh, warm water doesn't hold dissolve, dissolved oxygen very well. Um, it's a very stressful time to be handling and transporting fish. And um, it would certainly result in high mortality, uh, both immediately while handling and transporting is going on, but also delayed mortality through uh, disease onset after the fish were stocked out. So the end, uh, we obviously, you know, you can't gamble with 42,000 fish, let alone 42,000 endangered fish. So there's only one decision that is really right for us to make, um, and that was offload fish. And so we offloaded all of our Razorback sucker and bony tail uh, this past December and January. And the offloading process, uh, it, it, it was intense. It took us a couple months. Um, we had 42,000 fish that we had to sort and measure. Um, it turns out about 20,000 of, 20, of those fish were big enough to be tagged, and so we tagged 20,000 fish, uh, transported them, stocked them into the Colorado River. Uh, we had 22,000 juvenile fish left over that were too small to stock and tag, and so we had to uh, search out other facilities that could take those fish from us and rear those. Um, we were able to find a federal fish hatchery uh, to take those fish, and so we transported 22,000 uh, juvenile fish to the, that fish hatchery. So looking ahead here a little bit, um, I, I think it's safe to say that we made the appropriate call to stock those fish out. 
this winter. Our, the current 24 month projection is calling for uh, the lake to hit that 1051 mark rather than August or September like it was calling for last year. It, it's calling for it to reach that low this May. Uh, June is going to be 1047. July is going to be 1046. Um, so it, it, it turns out being proactive was the right thing to do. And so moving ahead here, um, we're working on getting a new intake, or that's what it's going to take to be able to operate fish, uh, operate the fish hatchery again as a new intake and pipeline. Um, that's going to be a two-phase process. First is obviously going to be design, engineering, uh, all the surveying that's involved with that, um, and all the necessary compliance that will occur. Um, then once that's completed, you'd move on to the construction and connection phase. Um, so while we don't have Razorback Sucker and Bony Tail at the facility right now, uh, we are going to open it. Uh, it's going to remain open. It's going to provide you know additional visitor experiences for visitors of Lake Mead. Um, we plan on partnering with the Boulder City Schools and the Henderson Schools to offer field trips. Uh, it's going to be endless opportunities for public outreach and provide information to the public. Uh, it's going to be a great facility for our conservation and education division to host angler workshops, wildlife workshops. Um, we'll be able to do all sorts of uh, training and host meetings in this room. Um, there's a little bit of a sneak peek of what our uh, the meeting and the I guess movie room is what we call it now looks like today. So to to uh, get a new intake and um, construct a new intake, it's not you know that's not a small task. In fact, it's going to be a massive effort, uh, one that would be way too large for Indo to be able to perform on its own. Um, luckily, we've established some strong working relationships with some of some of our cooperating partners, um, and in this case, the Southern Nevada Water Authority and the Bureau of Reclamation's MSCP um, is really going to be a, a, a strong proponent for this and um, help us get this process started. And so, at SNWA, they have a number of intakes at Lake Mead, including some that are very deep. Um, and so, we've we've. The plan is to find a way to be able to connect to one of those deeper um, intake infrastructures. And so we've recently uh, executed an interlocal agreement, and that's going to include phase one of the, the new intake uh, project. And so SNBUA and all their engineers, um, they're going to be doing surveying, design, uh, and all the compliance necessary um, for what it would take to be able to hook into their infrastructure and then to uh, hook it up to the hatchery. And SNWA, you know, they're, they're not looking for work. Those folks are super busy all the time. Um, and luckily, we're able to get them to partner with us through some longstanding relationships we've, we've had with some of their key personnel. Zane Marshall is their director of water resources currently. Uh, he's been with them for a few decades now. Um, he started up at the, the low level, the field level, and he did an awful lot of work at the field level with a lot of our field staff um, doing aquatic surveys, fish surveys throughout southern Nevada. Um, I think having that long-term key relationship with, with Zane was you know, important to get us to a point where SNWA was willing to dedicate some of their staff and time um, to do something that's important for Nevada and Endow. Um, and so the Bureau of Reclamation uh, we've been working with them for over 15 years. We've been receiving annual funding from the MSCP for 15 years. Um, and the interlocal agreement that we enter into with SNVA that's going to be funded from additional funding that we received from the MSCP. Uh, and so we just amended one of our, our current cooperative agreements with them. Um, they provide additional money, and now we're going to fund the SNWA to complete phase one. And again, we have um, you know a long history of working with key personnel at the Bureau. John Sweat is a program manager for the MSCP. Jim Stolberg is the fisheries program manager. Both John and Jim have been with the MSCP since it was created. Um, I've been working with John and Jim personally since 2009. Um, Jim was a field person uh, I mean, when I came to Indow. We were both field level and uh, we've kind of moved on in, in our agencies at the same same pace. And, uh, you know, the MSCP, they kind of have this yes attitude. They're not you know, their, their focus is implementing conservation measures for native wildlife and their habitat. Uh, for every year I've been a part of Indow, they always provide a crew to help us with our sport fish surveys, um, shad surveys, anything we've ever needed from the Bureau. They've always started out with a yes and they've always pulled through us. So they've, been, they've been a very strong partner of ours. 
Um, and kind of looking bigger picture here, the Colorado River, you know, it's designated critical habitat for a number of ESA listed species, uh, both aquatic and terrestrial. And so any type of water use uh, in the Colorado, um, any type of diversion, uh, withdrawal or anything, you know, it has some type of negative impact uh, on the habitat and the wildlife. And so they're, every, every entity or, you know, utility that takes water from the Colorado River, they have to implement certain conservation actions uh, to help negate those negative effects. And so things like, you know, native fish augmentation of the Lake Mead Hatchery and other uh, augmentation programs throughout the Colorado River, it's really critical to help, uh, you know, maintain those populations of ESA listed fish. So then we can be able to continue to use the water in the lower Colorado River, you know, and support communities across the Southwest. And so that's, that's all I got for you today. Uh, another little bit of sneak peek picture of our visitor center. Um, the address for the hatchery is 245 Lakeshore Road, and we hope to see folks out there, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I went long, I'm sorry. Thank you for that. That was really interesting. I can't wait to see the visitor center. Does anyone have questions for Mr. Sanger? Here, I'm sure we'll have some for you over there. No problem. Thanks for turning that off. <laughs> I've been in the spotlight all day. Um, uh, no? No questions? Okay. Thanks. Secretary Madam, Wasley. Madam Chair, just a couple housekeeping details. Um, when we assembled the agenda, we did not include a uh, public comment period at the close of today's meeting. I know that it isn't a requirement and that we aren't officially or formally adjourning, uh, but just in conversation with the DAG, um, might recommend that we do provide that. But before we do that, if, if you dis decide to do that, I, I would just like to uh, make a couple quick announcements. Uh, first of all, I'd like to publicly thank you for the pizzas for lunch. Oh. So thank you very much for that, uh, greatly appreciated. And then also, uh, just on the personnel front, um, I know I had mentioned, I think at our last virtual meeting that we were losing uh, Kathy T, Kathy Telegatis, who um, was our supervisor over data and technology services and counter staff and everything down here. Mm -hmm. We've been able to, uh, bring Kathy back in a limited capacity. Some of it is a uh, volunteer, but she had a huge hand in uh, assisting with that visitor center. And then um, her re replacement has been here, although I don't, I think she might have stepped out. She went out to the hatchery. Um, <laughs> but we also have uh, Cindy Bentley. Some of you may know Cindy. Um, who is at Data Technology Services and providing key support at the counter down here. So I wanted to announce Bernie and Cindy and uh, Kathy's departure and thank you. So that was all I had. As far as the logistics um, going out to the hatchery, we can cover that after uh, any kind of public comment. Okay. Yeah, I, I do think we should take it out for public comment. And I know we have a couple of folks here. So um, I'll open it up. I'll open up today the public comment. Uh, portion of our meeting. Mr. Foltz and Ms. Wright, do you have any public comment for us today? No, no, no. <laughs> gotcha, didn't I? <laughs> okay. All right, so I don't see any public comment. So let's talk about logistics. So logistics, uh, it, I, I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but I, in my mind, I can imagine a convoy of cars uh, with me able to negotiate um, free admission and being able to locate the hatchery and we'll have to kind of get out in the parking lot and make sure that everybody's got a ride um, so for what for what that's worth uh, and maybe maybe Brandon can help me out here uh, one of our con ed staff spoke with the uh, people at the fee booth yesterday and informed them that there's gonna be a number of folks coming out to tour the hatchery um, so all you should have to do is tell them that you're there to visit the Lake Mead hatchery uh, and they should let you on in thank you Okay, great. Thank you. And I just want to let everybody know we're back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So, all right. I will see you at the hatchery. Thanks.